WCW's rise in the mid-90s, marked by the formation of the New World Order and the success of Monday Nitro, challenged the WWE's dominance in the industry at the time. The innovative storylines, acquisition of major talent and the Monday Night Wars marked WCW's peak, captivating fans worldwide. But by 2001, all of that had ended. WCW had sent itself into an inescapable death spiral in an attempt to take out its competitors and had imploded under the weight of so many massive egos. It was horrible hodgepodge. The shows had no form and I could not follow anything as far as storylines. It was like reading a book by someone on LSD. The demise of World Championship Wrestling stands as one of the most significant events in professional wrestling history. In this video, we'll explore the key events leading to WCW's downfall, the reactions of fans and wrestlers, and the lasting legacy of the company on the wrestling world. Welcome everyone to the WrestlePod. Subscribe now for more pro wrestling and pop culture content. The good, the bad, and the ugly. On the evening of February the 6th, 1990, the Memorial Coliseum in Corpus Christi, Texas became the epicenter of the wrestling world. Clash 10, Texas Shootout, live. The good, the bad, and the ugly meet at the edge of town. Tuesday night, February 6th, 8.05 Eastern on TBS. With 3,000 spirited fans bearing witness live and a remarkable 4.5 rating achieved on television, the atmosphere was nothing short of electric. This pivotal event not only enthralled fans, but effectively set the stage for the highly anticipated Wrestle War event to come. The evening witnessed other intense bouts that kept the spectators on the edge of their seats. In one heated moment, the skyscrapers faced disqualification, the reason being the unwarranted introduction of a chair into the ring, breaking the agreed upon rules and adding an element of chaos into the match. An unveiling took place that night as Doom, hidden behind masks until that point, revealed the identities of the fierce duo of Ron Simmons and Butch Reed. The climax of the event was a heart-stopping encounter where Arn Anderson demonstrated sheer prowess, executing a masterful DDT to claim victory over the Dragon Master. While Sting was initially slated to grace the ring, a sudden turn of events earlier in the evening saw him expelled from the Horseman, and Ole Anderson stepped in as his replacement. However, the drama escalated when Sting couldn't restrain himself, rushing towards the ring in a bid to scale the cage, a courageous act that unfortunately resulted in a severe knee injury amid the fierce brawl that ensued. This unforeseen incident added a layer of raw, unrestrained emotion to an already charged event, marking Clash of Champions 10 as not just a competition, but a saga of passion, rivalry and the relentless pursuit of glory in WCW. Hey, homeboy, gather around. Some serious stuff is gonna go down. Call the Wrestle War Daddy, the kings of the ring. All come together and do the wild thing. Lex Luger, the stylish, nature boy, thing. Yeah, they all be doing that. Wild thing. Yeah, they all be there with something to prove. Brimming with intentions to bust the move. It's pay per view excitement for THE. For more information, call your cable company. Wow, wow, wow. wow. World Championship Wrestling's Wrestle War took place on February the 25th, as some unforeseen circumstances would change the short-term trajectory of the company. The Spotlight event was initially designed to feature Ric Flair defending his NWA World Heavyweight Championship against Sting. However, due to the unfortunate injury Sting sustained a few weeks earlier during the climactic moments of Clash of Champions, plans had to change. This unforeseen incident paved the way for Lex Luger, a close ally of Sting at the time, to step in as his replacement in this crucial match. As May of 1990 dawned, the American Wrestling Association found itself grappling with a dwindling fan base and rapidly diminishing glory. A promotion that once basked in the adulation of audiences in its stronghold of Minnesota was now struggling to fill seats. In a decisive attempt to rekindle the fire of its golden years, Vern Gagne, the heart and soul of AWA, orchestrated a strategic collaboration with World Championship Wrestling, setting the stage for a monumental event branded Twin Wars 90. The chosen ground for this resurrection was none other than St Paul's Historic Civic Centre, a venue that bore witness to AWA's crowning moments of glory in its heyday. AWA's reigning champion Larry Zabisco was pitted against the formidable Nikita Koloff in a duel of grit and determination. 
Adding to the electrifying atmosphere was the clash between the nature boy Ric Flair and flying Brian Pillman, a showdown of charisma and flying fists battling for the NWA WCW world title. On May the 19th, at the WCW Capital Combat event, the Washington crowd witnessed Lex Luger against then-champion Ric Flair in a steel cage match for the NWA World Heavyweight title. Fans were treated to an upset victory for Lex, but as he won when Ric Flair was disqualified, the title never changed hands inside the cage. The 11th installment of Clash of the Champions unfolded on June the 13th. This edition of Clash of the Champions was not just another event in the series, it felt more like a meticulously crafted prologue that set the stage for the much-anticipated wrestling spectacle to come, the Great American Bash. The arena reverberated with the intensity of the clash between Bam Bam Bigelow and Tommy Rich. The ferocious hold that Bam Bam applied on Rich was not relinquished even as the referee's count approached five, leading to his disqualification, but not before leaving the audience at the edge of their seats, heartbeats echoing the countdown. The pinnacle of the night was sculpted in the arena where Ric Flair stood, face to face with the junkyard dog. Yet, even legends find themselves embroiled in the throes of chaos as the four horsemen intruded into the sacred grounds of a one-on-one -on -one combat, forcing the hand of disqualification to be raised yet again. July brought with it continued success for World Championship Wrestling. The 1990 Great American Bash marked the sixth iteration of the annual wrestling pay-per-view event and the second one organised by WCW under the National Wrestling Alliance banner. It was held on June the 7th at the Baltimore Arena, the venue's third time hosting the event. The bash was notable for being the final one affiliated with the NWA before WCW's withdrawal in early 1991, and for featuring the debut of Big Van Vader in WCW. The spotlight of the evening was a fiercely contested main event, where Ric Flair defended the NWA World Heavyweight Championship against the challenger Sting. A decisive moment arrived when Sting skillfully countered Flair's figure four leg lock attempt, securing victory with a small package pin, ensuring a fair duel. Dudes with attitudes, including the Steiner brothers, Paul Orndorff and the Junkyard Dog, maintained a vigilant guard around the ring to ward off any interference from the four horsemen, while Ole Anderson was restrained with handcuffs to El Gigante. This well-orchestrated defence was instrumental in preserving the integrity of a match that saw Sting rise to the pinnacle of victory. On July the 15th, 1990, the Road Warriors marked their first appearance on WWF television, making their debut on an episode of Wrestling Challenge. The event was hosted at the Huntington Civic Center in Huntington, West Virginia. At the end of the 80s, WCW, while still under the umbrella of the NWA, initiated a Halloween-themed pay-per-view named Halloween Havoc. Following its initial success, the second instalment took place on October the 27th, 1990, at the UIC Pavilion in Chicago, solidifying Halloween Havoc as an annual staple in WCW's pay-per-view lineup. The 1990 edition was notable for the grandeur of its main event, where Sting successfully defended his NWA World Heavyweight Championship against Sid Vicious. The match witnessed a dramatic turn of events as Barry Windham impersonated Sting after an attack backstage before the match, leading Sid to believe he had won. However, the real Sting re-emerged to reclaim victory amidst a celebratory backdrop of fireworks and falling balloons. Following the match, a revealing interview with Sting was conducted by Jim Ross, shedding light on the dynamics and introducing discussion around the Black Scorpion. This event marked the end of Halloween Havoc under the NWA banner, as WCW parted ways with the company in January of 91. This period saw wrestlers evolving, with alliances dissolving and new partnerships forming, shaping the new era of WCW. December of 1990 brought with it the start of a revolution which would go on to shape the entire decade. Perhaps at the time it may not have seemed so monumental, but on December the 1st, World Championship Wrestling decided to remove the National Wrestling Alliance branding from their championship belts and television programming, marking a move away from underneath the NWA's shadow. Although at the time it was seen as merely WCW and its owners growing, which would in turn benefit the NWA. This single move would set in motion Ted Turner's brand pulling away completely over the next few years and the eventual collapse of the National Wrestling Alliance in its current state. 
December 16th saw WCW Starcade Collision Course. It was hosted at the Kill Auditorium in St. Louis, Missouri. The highlight of the event was the Steel Cage main event that saw Sting defend the NWA World Heavyweight Championship against then mysterious Black Scorpion, a rivalry intensified by the Black Scorpion's recurrent taunts aimed at Sting since his debut. The match reached its climax with the unmasking, revealing him to be Ric Flair, thereby setting the stage for an ongoing feud between Flair and Sting. Sting had managed to hold the WCW NWA World Heavyweight title through most of the year, and ended 1990 as the company's top champion. The formidable team of Doom consisting of Butch Reed and Ron Simmons were the WCW NWA Tag Team Champions at the end of a successful year, seeing off several challenging teams since winning the belts in May. On February 24th, WCW WrestleWar 91 took place at the Arizona Veterans Memorial Coliseum in Phoenix, Arizona. The main event featured a War Games match, pitting Sting, Brian Pillman and the Steiner Brothers against the four horsemen of Ric Flair, Barry Windham, Sid Vicious and Larry Zbysko. The match concluded when Sid Vicious powerbombed Brian Pillman multiple times, including one where Brian's head unintentionally struck the cage roof. Unable to continue, El Gigante entered the ring and conceded the match on Pillman's behalf. In the period following his tour of the US military, the future WWF star known as Road Dog Jesse James, whose real name is James Bryan, commenced his journey into professional wrestling. During this time, WCW programming acknowledged James Bryan while discussing his brother Brad's match against Bobby Eaton at the WrestleWar 91 pay-per-view. The commentary team mentioned that Brian was serving in Operation Desert Storm. After completing his military service, Brian returned to the wrestling ring after a five-year hiatus. On July 7, 1991, during the concluding night of World Championship Wrestling with the Great American Bash, he competed in his first match since his return, facing Terence Taylor and unfortunately losing that bout. On March the 21st, a collaboration took place between the Japanese wrestling promotion New Japan Pro Wrestling and the American-based WCW for the Super Show pay-per-view held in Tokyo. Notably, some of the matches from the event were exclusive to the live audience and not included in the pay-per-view broadcast. The main event featuring Ric Blair and Tatsumi Fujinami was presented differently in the United States as it was to in Japan. During the event, it was announced that Ric Blair's NWA World Heavyweight Championship was at stake, but not the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. In the US, these titles were regarded as the same thing, represented by a single belt. The pay-per-view announcers stated that Fujinami's IWGP Heavyweight Championship was also on the line, although this was not mentioned during the introduction. The match's outcome was also handled quite differently. In front of the Japanese audience, Fujinami defeated Blair by pinfall with the count performed by New Japan referee Taiga Hattori, who had stepped in for the NWA referee Bill Alfonso after Alfonso was knocked out during the match. The victory resulted in Fujinami winning the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. However, in the US, the title change was not recognized. It was claimed that Fujinami had been disqualified for throwing Ric Flair over the top rope whilst Alfonso was incapacitated, and therefore he did not officially win the match. On May the 19th, the inaugural WCW Super Bowl event aired from the Bayfront Center in Florida. During the undercard, Bobby Eaton clinked the WCW World Television Championship by defeating Arn Anderson, while the Steiner brothers successfully defended their WCW World Tag Team Championships. The opening match saw the fabulous Freebirds capture the vacant WCW United States belts. The main event featured a clash between the reigning WCW Heavyweight Champion in Ric Flair and the NWA World Heavyweight Champion in Tatsumi Fujinami, with both prestigious world championships at stake. In the United States, the match was primarily promoted as a contest for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship without highlighting Fujinami's early victory over Flair for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship in Japan in March. The storyline in the United States centered on Ric Flair seeking revenge against Fujinami while defending his World Heavyweight Championship. In contrast, the Japanese promotion billed the match as being for both championships. This approach painted Flair as a more heroic character, diverging from his villainous persona in the year leading up to the match. As a result, the Florida crowd rallied behind Flair, cheering him on during the bout. The year 1992 commenced with a resounding spectacle as WCW and New Japan joined forces for Super Show 2. 
known as Super Warriors in Tokyo Dome in Japan. This monumental event unfolded on January the 4th and marked the inception of the New Japan January 4th Dome Show, subsequently establishing itself as an annual tradition and the pinnacle of New Japan's annual calendar. With a total of 12 matches, including two preliminary dark matches preceding the pay-per-view broadcast, the event showcased an intriguing blend of talent from both WCW and New Japan. Notably, six of these 12 thrilling encounters featured WCW wrestlers. The event boasted three marquee matchups, each brimming with main event caliber excitement. The opening clash witnessed WCW heavyweight champion Lex Luger triumph over Masahiro Chono in a hard fought singles match. In the subsequent bout, Tatsumi Fujinami relinquished his IWGP Heavyweight Championship to Ricky Choshu, adding a twist of unpredictability to the event. Culminating in a crescendo of adrenaline, the grand finale featured the Japanese heavy metal sensation Shoya serenading the crowd as the Steiner brothers clashed with the formidable duo of the Great Muta and Sting, representing the top babyfaces of both New Japan and WCW. On February the 29th, Milwaukee, Wisconsin hosted WCW Super Brawl 2, a thrilling event with nine matches, including a dark match. Highlights included Rick Rude vs. Ricky Steamboat for the United States Heavyweight Championship, Jushin Liger vs. Brian Pillman for the light heavyweight belt, and Arn Anderson and Bobby Eaton vs. the Steiner Brothers for the World Tag Team Championships. Barry Windham and Dustin Rhodes faced... Larry Zabisco and Steve Austin in another exciting tag match. The main event saw Lex Luger and Sting clash for the WCW Heavyweight Championship. Sting's daring move, a diving crossbody, led to an unexpected twist as he fell outside the ring. However, he quickly regained control, defeating Harley Race and ultimately pinning Luger to become the new champion. Notably, this marked Lex Luger's departure from WCW as he ventured into the World Bodybuilding Federation and later the WWF. On May the 17th, WCW presented Wrestle War 92 from Jacksonville, Florida, marking the fourth and final installment of this wrestling pay-per-view series produced by World Championship Wrestling. The event unfolded at Jacksonville Memorial Coliseum and featured a diverse lineup of matches. One of the key bouts was an intense tag team showdown featuring the Steiner brothers facing off against Takayuki Izuki and Tatsumi Fujinami. The stakes were high, and the victors would earn the coveted title of number one contender for the IWGP Tag Team Championships. Ultimately, the Steiner brothers secured the win when Rick Steiner executed a super overhead belly-to-belly -belly suplex, pinning his counterpart. The event's main attraction was the War Games match, a battle of epic proportions. Sting's squadron consisting of Barry Windham, Dustin Rhodes, Nikita Koloff, Ricky Steamboat, and Sting himself locked horns with the formidable Dangerous Alliance, represented by Arn Anderson, Bobby Eaton, Larry Zabisco, Rick Rude and Steve Austin. The climax of this intense contest arrived when Zabisco accidentally struck Eaton in the shoulder with the metal connector from the turnbuckle. This critical misstep enabled Sting to apply an armbar to Eaton, forcing him to submit and securing victory for Sting's squadron. On June the 12th in Mobile, Alabama, WCW presented the inaugural Beach Blast professional wrestling pay-per-view. The 1992 Beach Blast marked a significant milestone in the company's history as it was the first event of its kind. It showcased two main events. The first was a highly anticipated 30-minute Iron Man challenge, pitting Ricky Steamboat against Rick Rude as the culmination of their long-standing feud. The second main event featured the Steiner brothers putting their WCW World Tag Team Championships on the line against the formidable team of Terry Gordy and Steve Williams. Notably, the event took place during a transitional period for the company, with Bill Watts assuming control of the promotion. This marked the beginning of Watts' implementation of new rules, some of which were enforced for the first time at Beach Blast. One such rule prohibited any moves that involved jumping off the top rope, resulting in an automatic disqualification. This rule change added an intriguing layer to the proceedings. On June the 26th, 1992, the Steiner brothers secured the IWGP Tag Team Championships during a New Japan Pro Wrestling event. In an electrifying showdown, they triumphed over the formidable duo of Big Van Vader and Bam Bam Bigelow, emerging as the new IWGP Tag Team Champions. However, their reign was short-lived. 
On July the 5th, at a live event, the Steiner brothers faced Terry Gordy and Steve Williams and fortunately relinquished their World Tag Team Championships to the formidable challengers. On July the 12th in Albany, Georgia, the stage was set for a monumental event as WCW presented the Great American Bash. The evening featured a tournament to establish the inaugural NWA World Tag Team Champions, and it was an action-packed affair with seven exciting matches. In the tournament's culmination, Terry Gordy and Steve Williams, collectively known as the Miracle Violence Connection, squared off against Dustin Rhodes and Barry Wyndham. The hard-fought battle ended with Gordy and Williams emerging victorious, securing their place in history as the first ever NWA World Tag Team Champions. Additionally, Great American Bash witnessed a WCW World Heavyweight Championship defence, with Sting putting his title on the line against the formidable Big Van Vader. In a stunning turn of events, Vader managed to defeat Sting and claim the championship. On December 28th, WCW presented Starcade Battle Bowl, the Lethal Lottery 2, at the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia. The event featured the second Lethal Lottery tournament, where randomly paired tag teams competed for a spot in the final Battle Bowl Battle Royal match. The show included Ron Simmons defending the WCW World Heavyweight Championship against Dr. Death Steve Williams. Shane Douglas and Ricky Steamboat defending the World Tag Team Championships against Brian Pillman and Barry Windham, and Masahiro Chono defending the NWA World Heavyweight Belt against the Great Muta. Additionally, Sting faced Vader in the finals of the King of the Cable Tournament. This event also marked announcer Jim Ross's last appearance on a WCW pay-per-view, as he would soon be on to join WWE. Ric Flair emerged as a dominant force, earning the titles of PWI Wrestler of the Year and Wrestling Observer's Wrestler of the Year. In tag team wrestling, Steve Williams and Terry Gordy were celebrated as both PWI Tag Team and Wrestling Observer Tag Team of the Year. In WCW, Big Van Vader became the heavyweight champion, reclaiming his title from Ron Simmons at a New Year's Eve house show. The year kicked off with an exciting collaboration between New Japan Pro Wrestling and the WCW, for the Fantastic Story pay-per-view event on January the 4th at the Tokyo Dome. This spectacular event attracted 63,500 fans and generated over $3 million in ticket revenue alone, marking the second year of collaboration with the American WCW. The event featured a total of 10 bouts. Highlights included Sting's victory over Hiroshi Hase. A notable highlight was the title match, where Jushin Thunder Liger claimed the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship from Ultimo Dragon. Additionally, the Great Muta, holding the IWGP Heavyweight Championship, secured the NWA World Heavyweight Championship in a dual title match against Masahiro Chono. The, the following event was later broadcast as WCW New Japan Super Show 3 in North America. On the 10th of February, Bill Watts resigned as Executive Vice President of Wrestling Operations for WCW. Two days later, Eric Bischoff became Executive Producer of all of World Championship Wrestling's television, and Ole Anderson was announced as the new Vice President of Wrestling Operations, marking a huge turning point for the company, the ripple effect of which would change the course of the next decade in the pro wrestling world. In February of 1993, Ric Flair made a celebrated return to WCW, greeted warmly as a hero. Bound by a no-compete clause at the time, Flair couldn't immediately step back into the ring for a match. Instead, he took on a different role by hosting his own talk show in WCW, aptly named a Flair for the Gold. The show featured regular appearances by Arn Anderson, who was often seen at the bar on the set. Additionally, the show was spiced up by the presence of Flair's maid, Fifi, who was involved in various activities like cleaning and presenting gifts. This event also marked the first WCW appearance of Davy Boy Smith, known as the British Bulldog. The highlight of the evening was a unique White Castle of Fear strap match between Big Van Vader and Sting, where, notably, Vader's WCW World Heavyweight Championship was not at stake, as the match was not officially sanctioned by the company. Additionally, the event showcased a clash between the Great Muta and Barry Windham for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. This particular pay-per-view was the first under the executive production of Eric Bischoff, who also maintained his role as a television announcer. His new executive role was only acknowledged in the show's closing credits. 
On May the 23rd, WCW hosted its first Slamboree pay-per-view event, subtitled A Legends Reunion, at the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia. This inaugural event was marked by Davy Boy Smith's victory over Big Man Vader, the then champion, via disqualification in a match for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Slamboree 93 celebrated wrestling's past and present with the induction of legends such as Luthez, Mr. Wrestling 2, Vern Garnier and Eddie Graham into the WCW Hall of Fame. On July the 7th, WCW Worldwide commenced its taping at Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida. These sessions produced matches and footage scheduled to air starting the weekend of August the 28th. We all subconsciously assess one another when we first meet a stranger for the first time. It's human nature, hardwired into our DNA. We may not even realise we're doing it, but we are. How many of you can say that you've never been introduced to a completely new person, perhaps through a friend or someone at work? This person makes you laugh immediately with their introduction, stands confidently and takes time to listen to you and make note of your name. They're wearing clothes which you seem to like and as they engage with you in whatever small talk is necessary to break the ice, you both feel more at ease in each other's presence and the conversation begins to flow. But admit it, We've all been unfortunate enough to suffer through the opposite. A cold hello, followed by a succession of long pauses and brutally repetitive interruptions. Perhaps a mutually sweaty handshake and then a swift exit. For some unknown reason, in this moment, you've just got an instant dislike, distrust or outright disdain for this poor unsuspecting stranger. And they probably don't want to come rushing back for excruciating conversation round two anytime soon. They may be well-intentioned, kind and potentially a new friend, but perhaps they have the same strong aftershave as someone you dislike from years past. Perhaps they have the exact same watch as that teacher you always hated at school, or the same hair as someone who bullied you in your distant memories. None of these characteristics are logical reasons to dislike someone. Most times, it's easy enough to overcome these small obstacles in our subconscious behaviour and move on to healthy and fruitful relationships with people who we may not have initially been so attracted to. But sometimes, they're not. Sometimes, someone can make such a terrible first impression so as that the first memory is seared into your mind's eye. Every time you think of them, that's the moment that you first recall. And that isn't a particularly pleasant thought. I'd like to think that we're better than that, but... Admit it, there is at least one person who tripped over and spilled their lunch in the cafeteria at school, or who puked on their first big night out when they turned 18. If you take it up by about a 100 orders of magnitude, imagine making a first impression in pro wrestling, live, unedited and viral to millions around the world. Yes, part of the draw for fans like me, who watch wrestling regularly, is the sense of the unexpected. Usually that means moments like these that live long in the memory as truly unpredictable and astonishing. But sometimes it means moments like these, which WWE and other pro wrestling companies are much more fond of the idea of us forgetting ever happened. Oh, and if you were one of those people who said that you couldn't think of anyone who made a bad first impression which you couldn't erase from your mind, no, you still haven't thought of anyone, well... You are too high-minded and gracious to ever hold on to such a terrible first memory of someone, I get it. Let me remind you then of Fred Alex Ottman, forever known in the annals of sports entertainment folklore as the Shockmaster. From 1989 to 1993, Fred Ottman had been used in small parts as one half of large bulky tag teams such as the natural disasters in the WWF. Ottman had struggled to find his niche in his early career, going under different monikers such as Big Steel Man and the much less menacing sounding Tugboat Tyler, which eventually got shortened to the now iconic Tugboat. One of the worst names ever bestowed upon a character in perhaps all of wrestling's history. By 1993, Tugboat's partners had gone their separate ways and after having a few singles matches, left the WWF heading to their rival company WCW, where he would be honoured to be blessed with the most perfect character, outfitted in state-of-the-art sci-fi clothing and even having his voice edited to have more charisma 
and be more intimidating. Debuting alongside the likes of Sting and Ric Flair, he shot straight into the main event picture and in one of the biggest wrestling companies in the world. Fred Ottman went on to have, undoubtedly, the greatest wrestling career of any performer to ever grace the screens of WCW. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This happened. Fred Ottman was given a Star Wars Stormtrooper helmet, painted with silver paint and glitter, a vest, and told to burst through this wall. The Shockmaster lived up to his name as Ottman tripped on a low wooden beam to gasps and laughs from the crowd in attendance. But that was only the start. Surely, that was enough to have finished this character off. But no. As Ottman clambered to put his helmet back on and regained his feet, the live wrestling segment had to continue. The other wrestlers were stifling laughter as they had to try and get through their scripts. The idea for the Shockmaster's voice was for a mic to be rigged up and off screen a performer with a better grasp of how to cut a menacing promo would be relayed over the top of the audio, with Ottman simply moving his arms and head in order to seem like the words were coming from him. Simple in theory, but the delay caused by the setup of the audio equipment meant that the whole show just fell apart alongside, unfortunately, Fred Ottman's career. On September the 19th, WCW hosted its first full brawl pay-per-view event in Houston, Texas at the Astro Arena. The main event was a War Games match where the teams of Sting, Davey Boy Smith, Dustin Rhodes and the Shockmaster, accompanied by Road Warrior Animal, triumphed over Sid Vicious, Vader and Harlem Heat of Cole and Kane, who were joined by Harley Race and Colonel Robert Parker. Full Brawl 93 also featured significant title changes, including Rick Rude defeating Ric Flair for the WCW International World Heavyweight Championship, Lord Regal winning the World Television Championship, and the Nasty Boys claiming the World Tag Team titles. Mean Gene Oakland, a highly regarded figure in the professional wrestling world, made his debut with World Championship Wrestling on October the 6th, during a taping of WCW's Saturday Night in Atlanta, Georgia. This episode later aired on November the 5th. Oakland's move to WCW at this time was a significant shift in his career as he had previously been synonymous with the WWF. His debut in WCW marked the beginning of a new chapter for both Oakland and the promotion, bringing his unique interviewing style and comedic presence to WCW broadcasts. The 1993 Halloween Havoc, held on October the 24th at the Lakefront Arena in New Orleans, Louisiana, was the fifth annual event of its kind produced by WCW. A notable highlight of this pay-per-view event was the Texas Deathmatch featuring Big Van Vader, accompanied again by Harley Race against Cactus Jack. This match, known for its intensity and physicality in the years since, added to the overall allure and excitement of the Halloween-themed wrestling event, marking it as a memorable addition in the series. One violent incident between Sid Vicious and Arn Anderson occurred on October the 27th in Blackburn, England. The aggression was a result of a heated argument that escalated dramatically. After spending hours on the road with little sleep and too much alcohol consumed, tempers flared between the two wrestlers, reportedly over a remark made about Ric Flair, a friend of Anderson. The dispute escalated to a violent confrontation in the hotel hallway involving a pair of scissors. This brutal altercation resulted in Arn Anderson suffering 20 stab wounds to the chest and stomach, while Sid Vicious was stabbed more than four times. Following the incident, both wrestlers spent the night in the hospital and were subsequently deported back to America. Sid faced the repercussions of this altercation within WCW as he was fired after several wrestlers threatened to walk out if he was not terminated, whilst Anderson received only a suspension. In the aftermath, Sid Vicious apologised to Anderson for the incident and they are reported to be on good terms today. In 1993, WCW Battle Bowl was held on November the 20th in Pensacola, Florida. It was a unique event, primarily featuring the Battle Bowl tournament. This tournament was structured around the lethal lottery concept, where tag teams were formed by randomly drawing names. The team that won their respective matches then progressed to the Battle Bowl Battle Royal main event. This concept had been previously used in Starcade 1991 and 92, but 93 marked its debut as a standalone show. Big Fan Vader, who was the WCW World Heavyweight Champion at the time, emerged victorious in this battle royal, lastly eliminating Sting. 
Final stages of the match saw dramatic moments with Vader's manager Harley Race pulling Ric Flair out of the ring, leading to Flair's elimination. The final showdown between Sting and Vader ended with Vader achieving victory. The 1993 Battle Bowl was a significant event in the company's history, showcasing the promotion's ability to create unique and engaging wrestling formats. Vader's triumph at this event further cemented his status as a dominant force within the company. The event also marked a period of expansion for WCW in terms of its pay-per-view offerings as it added more shows to its annual schedule. On December the 27th, Starcade, WCW's 11th annual pay-per-view event, celebrated its 10th anniversary at the Independence Arena in Charlotte, North Carolina. The event was notable for Ric Flair's return to Starcade, his first since 1990. The main event featured Ric Flair defeating Vader, the reigning WCW World Heavyweight Champion, in a title versus career match. The event also included notable matches like the Nasty Boys vs Sting and Road Warrior Hawk for the WCW Tag Team Championship, Rick Rude vs The Boss for the WCW International World Heavyweight Championship, and a two out of three falls match between Dustin Rhodes and Steve Austin for the United States belt. Wrestling Observer's Newsletter's Wrestler of the Year for 1993 was Big Van Vader. Pro Wrestling Illustrated also gave their highest honour for 1993 Wrestler of the Year to WCW's standout big man. Vader had been in and around the WCW World Championship picture all year with standout matches against Ric Flair and Sting. WCW had recently crowned Ric Flair as their top star at Starcade on December the 27th. Their USA Championship also changed hands at the same event, with Steve Austin claimed as the champion at the end of 1993. The WCW Tag Championships were held at the end of the year by the Nasty Boys. At the end of 1993, Bobby Heenan, beloved commentator and hilarious addition to WWF for so many years, left the company. My contract was up in 93, and Vince gave me an offer for a new contract. A week later, he told me that he couldn't honour that offer and wanted me to take a 50% pay cut. I didn't want to do that. I was tired of going to New York, tired of crowds and tired of people. It was just hard to get around. I decided it was time to go. At Clash of the Champions 26, on January the 27th, Heenan jumped ship to WCW and made his on-air debut. I got a call from Eric Bischoff and he made me an offer to work one day a week for the same money Vince had offered me. At that time, my daughter Jessica was going to the University of Alabama. I lived in Tampa and would work in Atlanta, which was only 200 miles from her. Once a week, I could go up and see her for lunch. That's why I took the job with WCW. The inaugural Spring Stampede pay-per-view event by World Championship Wrestling was held on April the 17th at the Rosemont Horizon in Chicago. The main event featured Ric Flair defending the World Heavyweight Championship against Ricky Steamboat. The match was a showcase of skill and strategy. Steamboat initially dominated Flair with an array of moves, but his momentum faltered when he missed a drop kick. This gave Flair the opportunity to retaliate with his signature chops. A missed charge by Steamboat led to him crashing into the railing, but he quickly recovered, taking the fight back into the ring with Steamboat then unleashed a flurry of chops and skillfully applied Flair's trademark figure four leg lock. Steamboat nearly secured victory with a diving crossbody, but Flair narrowly avoided a diving splash, leading to Steamboat injuring his knee. After delivering another superplex, both competitors were downed. In a climactic moment, Steamboat used a double chicken wing on Flair, but in a twist, both men's shoulders were pinned to the mat, resulting in a double pinfall. This unique outcome meant that Flair retained his title, adding a memorable chapter to the history of WCW Spring Stampede and the rivalry between Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat. Hulk Hogan's debut on WCW Saturday night on June the 10th was a defining moment in the landscape of professional wrestling. His transition from WWE to WCW was a major surprise, given his long-standing association and success with the WWE. This monumental shift was highlighted by an elaborate parade at Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida, signifying Hogan's grand entrance. This event blended the glamour of entertainment with the raw energy of wrestling, attracting large numbers of fans. After leaving the WWE in 1993 to pursue acting, many thought Hogan's wrestling career had concluded. His return to the ring with WCW reignited excitement amongst wrestling enthusiasts and sparked discussions about potential new feuds and alliances. Hogan's move to WCW demonstrated his lasting influence in the sport. 
I just saw Shaquille O'Neal in the back. It's Shaquille! It. Shaquille, who cares? July the 17th marked a significant day for WCW and the broader wrestling community. The commentary team featured Tony Schiavone on play-by-play, with Bobby Heenan and Jesse Ventura providing colour commentary. This event was special as it showcased Hulk Hogan's in-ring debut for WCW at Bash of the Beach. With over 40 minutes left in the show, Shivani and Heenan set the stage for the main event. The build-up included Michael Buffer, WCW Commissioner Nick Bockwinkle and Shaquille O'Neal entering the ring, adding a sense of importance to the match. Buffer's extended introductions, including an unexpected detour discussing the moon landings, left about 30 minutes for Hogan and Flair to have their match. The bout itself lasting around 20 minutes was a dynamic display of pro wrestling styles. Despite some critics of Hogan's in-ring techniques, this match was undeniably entertaining. It featured the familiar tactics of both Hogan and Flair along with frequent interference from Sherry Martel and a rare glimpse of Hogan's technical wrestling skills, typically reserved for his matches in Japan. The combination of these elements resulted in an electric performance that was met with tremendous enthusiasm from the audience. This bout, often cited as one of Hogan's best in recent years, concluded as expected with a victory for Hulk Hogan. The match was packed with engaging moments leading up to this conclusion. Post-match, Hogan's victory celebration included appearances by Mr. T, Muhammad Ali, Jimmy Hart and Shaquille O'Neal, further highlighting the match's significance and the festive atmosphere of the event. PWI Wrestler of the Year for 1994 went to Hulk Hogan for his iconic departure from WWF and history-changing impact as he exploded onto our screens for WCW. Hulk Hogan had claimed the WCW World Heavyweight Belt at Bash of the Beach, making him WCW's top champion going into the new year, with Vader as the United States Heavyweight Champion having claimed the gold at Starcade a few days prior. Harlem Heat entered 1995 as the WCW Tag Team Champions, having won the belts at the beginning of December. However, the tape delay meant that their victory was not aired on television until January of 1995. WCW Super Bowl V took place on February 19th, 1995 from the Baltimore Arena in Baltimore, Maryland. In the main event, Hulk Hogan successfully defended the World Heavyweight Championship against Vader as Vader was disqualified due to Ric Flair's interference in the bout. In the penultimate match, Sting and Randy Savage defeated Avalanche and Big Bubba Rogers. Also at the event, Harlem Heat of Booker T and Stevie Ray retained the World Tag Team Championships against the Nasty Boys by disqualification. An infamous match took place at the event in which Alex Wright defeated Paul Roma, during which Roma kicked out of Wright's pinfall attempt where Roma was supposed to lose. The referee counted the pinfall anyway and awarded the win to Wright. No replay of the fall was ever shown. Roma's lack of cooperation in the match and refusal to lose to Wright led to his dismissal from WCW a month later. On March the 19th, WCW hosted their uncensored pay-per-view event. Highlights included the King of the Road match in a caged trailer on an 18-wheeler where the goal was to reach the top and honk a horn, won by Blacktop Bully. This pre-recorded match, near Atlanta, faced heavy edits due to WCW's No Blood Rule. Dustin Rhodes and Bully were fired for violating it. In the Boxer vs Wrestling match, Johnny B. Bad defeated Arn Anderson in the fourth round, though Anderson's TV championship wasn't at stake. The event, marketed as Rule Free, saw an odd disqualification. Avalanche lost to Randy Savage after an attack, by a disguised Ric Flair. The Nasty Boys and Harlem Heat match, with no tag team titles at stake, turned chaotic in the concession area, featuring impromptu weapons like cotton candy. A subplot involved Hulk Hogan's manager Jimmy Hart being abducted by Vader and Flair, but he escaped to support the Renegade at ringside. During Hogan's non-title match against Vader, interference by Flair and a masked man, later revealed as Randy Savage, ensued, leading to Hogan's victory. The first masked man was unmasked as Alan Anderson, tied up by Savage. Brad Riggins called me and said, Hey, Mr. Inoki is coming to Denver, and he would really like to become reacquainted with Muhammad Ali. They had lost touch. There had not been any conversations subsequent to their fight. So they had completely lost touch, and I, the year before, had done some business with Muhammad Ali and become, I don't want to say friends, but friendly. I called Muhammad's wife and said, here's the situation, and Antonio Inoki would love to meet Muhammad, and here's the dates. And next thing I know, I'm sitting in a hotel room in Denver, 
and Antonio and Noki seeing each other for the first time since that fight. Me being able to make that happen and facilitate that probably went a long way for Antonio and Noki, and it was one year later that now I'm on a jet flying to Pyongyang, North Korea, sitting next to Muhammad Ali. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, in 1995, North Korea was struggling to cope with a devastating famine. In order to try and bring eyes to the struggles of the Korean people and some good publicity for the internationally abhorred North Korean government, Eric Bischoff and Antonio Inoki devised a plan to take pro wrestling to Korea. Owing to his close relationship with the Korean Ricky Dozan, Inoki was treated differently to other foreigners in the North and was afforded a level of respect by Korean officials not often put on display. The project started out with the ambitious goal of bringing together the North Korean people and the rest of the world, and would turn out to be the largest and most highly attended pro wrestling event of all time. They're the two biggest attended pro wrestling shows ever. They were not the two biggest paid, but they were the two biggest by a huge margin, actually. Every record always broken, but I can't imagine how this one would be. Eric Bischoff brought with him the likes of Ric Flair, Road Warrior Hawk, Scott Norton, Chris Benoit, Two Cold Scorpio and the Steiner Brothers. Anoki similarly brought a host of top Japanese talent to contend with the Americans. However, what started in genuine good faith quickly turned sour as the Korean government sought to control every aspect of the show and the performers' actions whilst inside their strictly regulated country. All of the visitors' transport was arranged for them at precise times, including their flight into North Korea. This thing looked like it flew in World War II, man. It was a mess, old and rickety. It was just a heap. We tried to order a beer and they're all hot. Nothing was refrigerated. The flight was terrible. It was a prop and transport plane, so it was not the most comfortable. For someone like Scott Norton, who weighed close to 360 pounds, it was a little uncomfortable. The quality of the old plane was the first indication that perhaps the rosy idea of North Korea that some of the wrestlers had previously had in their minds may have been false. We went in the airport and they were turning lights on and half of them didn't work. There was dust caked everywhere. Nobody, it seemed, had been through the airport in years. The two-day event would go on to be watched live by over 350,000 Koreans, with 190,000 people packed into the stadium on the second day for the main event. On April the 22nd and 29th, 1995, at May Day Stadium in Pyongyang, North Korea, watching news footage and scenes from this event is seriously almost surreal. Far larger than any show WWE has ever put on, the spectacle of the show feels more like the opening ceremony of an Olympics. But this apparent support for pro wrestling in Korea turned out to be far more sinister than any of the wrestlers would have imagined. Me and Ric Flair were taking this crappy limo to the Collision in Korea event the first day. I said, Rick, man, we're really drawing, look at this. The driver looked back and said, excuse me, what do you mean by drawing? I answered, that's a term we use when a lot of people are coming to see us. He replied, no, nobody really wants to come. It's forced attendance. If they don't show up, they get a bullet in the head. As the show began, it was apparent that the glamour and grandiose nature of the event was manufactured by force. The Koreans in attendance yawned and fidgeted their way through hours of pro wrestling, a form of entertainment many of them had never seen and even more had no interest in. The crowd was quiet throughout, with mumbled whispers heard during slow periods of combat. The atmosphere feels more like being forced to attend a funeral for someone you've never met than a display of joy and unity through pro wrestling. The main event was planned to be Antonio Inoki facing off against his old rival in Hulk Hogan. However, Hogan continually denied Eric Bischoff and Inoki's requests, stating that he felt North Korea was too dangerous for someone with such a famous face. Bischoff explained that he tried several times to entice Hogan, but was ultimately unsuccessful, stating, Inoki and Hogan had a long history that dated back to the 80s, so it would have been a great thing for Inoki in many respects but I might have well have asked him to row a boat to Pluto. It was not going to happen. North Korean propaganda has shown American soldiers killing children and shooting down families for generations. The people of North Korea, without access to international news or media, were led to believe that all Americans are violent, loudmouthed, arrogant and sex-crazed, with glowing white hair and glittering blue eyes, who spend all of their money on unnecessarily fancy clothing and gluttonous amounts of drugs and alcohol. So, to prove them wrong... In comes Ric Flair. As he made his way to the ring, the crowd seemed more shocked than entertained by Ric Flair's appearance and mannerisms. Here we are, Mayday Stadium, 
Can you be more American than Ric Flair? Star-studded robes and his entrance music. If you can imagine that music playing, him marching to the ring. The audience probably had never seen anything like that. Blonde hair, blue eyes, guy wearing a star-studded robe. I would like to know what they thought. The crowd didn't respond to anything that I can remember until Winoki came out there. It certainly wasn't because I was overwhelmingly popular with them. They probably said, who's this guy? But Inoki, he appealed to them. When Inoki made his appearance, it felt like the homegrown hero had returned to claim his throne. This would prove to be the only single time that Ric Flair and Antonio Inoki would face off in the two men's historic careers. The event received few pay-per-view buys from WCW fans back in the US and had been pushed to the back of the WWE catalogue since they purchased the rights to the footage back in 2001. You'd think that with their love for making in-depth documentaries about wrestling's past, WWE would leap at the chance to cover such an unusual and controversial subject that they already own the rights to. However, some people speculate that if WWE did ever make the collision in Korea a topic for public discussion, they would have to admit that their company does not hold the world attendance record for a pro wrestling show. I'm not sure about this angle, to be fair. But I do see that the complex relationship between North Korea and the United States in the years since has probably not pushed WWE closer to tackling this fascinating event. Part of the trip was Anoki's way back into mainstream political awareness in Japan, and he had good relations with certain people within the Japanese government, which helped facilitate this. Antonio Inoki would take the event as an opportunity to further solidify his relationship with the North Korean government and would visit the country regularly throughout the rest of his life to discuss politics and governance with some of the nation's top officials. When asked about his meeting with Ri Su Yong, Inoki said this of the vice chairman of the North ruling's Workers' Party of Korea. He told me Pyongyang will continue his nuclear testing and take it to a higher level unless the global community, especially the US, stops applying pressure. The United Nations, Trump and Japan are all saying we need to apply more pressure. First, we need to listen to them and understand what the reasons are behind their activity. Inoki saw himself as a possible link between Korea and the rest of the world as an ambassador for peace, working to convince his fellow Japanese politicians to do the same. They have hinted they wanted to visit North Korea eventually, if given the chance, Inoki said of his fellow Japanese politicians. I really think that Japan should take a role as mediator between the US and North Korea. As the only country which was bombed during World War II with nuclear weapons, Japan should be advocating that we should avoid nuclear war from happening again. Antonio Inoki's work in North Korea was immortalised when his likeness was applied to a postage stamp, an honour virtually unheard of for a non-North Korean to receive, which goes some way to show just how respected the Japanese athlete was within the country. However, Inoki's close relationship with the controversial North Korean government has come at a price. Back in Japan, many have been uneasy about Inoki's allies in Korea and have questioned his motives. I'm past 70 now, so I'm prepared to receive the final call whenever my time comes. In the future, even when I'm not around anymore, I hope that the steady exchange with North Korea will not be extinguished. Full Brawl once again came around in September. The pre-show for the pay-per-view event was aired on WCW Main Event. During this segment, Eddie Guerrero made his first WCW television appearance facing Alex Wright. The match concluded prematurely when Wright asked referee Nick Patrick to halt the match due to an injury Guerrero sustained. Ric Flair had recently reclaimed the WCW World Heavyweight Belt at Starcade on December the 27th. At the same event, One Man Gang had captured the WCW United States Championship, ending the year as holder of the company's second most important title. Johnny B. Bad was the television champion at year's end, having claimed the belt at Halloween Havoc in October, and WCW's tag champions at this time were Harlem Heat, who by this point were becoming prolific in their endeavours to capture the WCW tag belts as many times as possible. Eric Bischoff, the former president of WCW, revealed that Brian Pillman was released from his contract with the company with the intention of allowing him to join ECW at this time and refine the character he was developing as the loose cannon. Brian was very proactive and constructive in his approach to it. This was when he and I started talking about what to do with his character and how to utilise him in a different way. The plan was for Pillman to then return to WCW with his persona contributing to the company's desired level of unpredictability on their Monday Nitro show. Unfortunately, things didn't unfold as anticipated for Bischoff. On February the 17th, 1996, Pillman made a surprising debut at Extreme Championship Wrestling's Cyber Slam event. 
much to the delight of the Philadelphia crowd, who had greeted him with an uproarious cheer. However, in a testament to Pillman's talent as a performer, he managed to quickly turn that enthusiastic audience against him through the use of a venomous promo. In a matter of minutes, he threatened to urinate in the centre of the ring, shifting the crowd's sentiment. Although Pillman made a few more appearances for ECW, he ultimately decided to sign with, with the World Wrestling Federation in June, turning the whole deal with Eric Bischoff on its head and for a brief spell coming out on top. It was there that he would conclude his career in professional wrestling before his life came to a tragic and sudden end. We will never get to see what could have been with one of the most promising performers of his generation, but we will always have Brian Pillman's energy and passion for pro wrestling perfectly displayed during his time in ECW. At Halloween Havoc in 1996, Hall and Nash defeated Harlem Heat to become the WCW Tag Team Champions, and Hogan defeated Savage to retain his belt. Now, not only did the New World Order hold the passion from the fans and the attention of those in the locker room, but also all three major championships within the company. At the end of the event, Roddy Piper made a surprise return and came face to face with Hulk. With him, Piper brought a revelation. He had hinted at the fact that the NWO were not working alone in their coup of WCW and were, in fact, working with someone high up in the company in order to reach their goals. Roddy Piper revealed this person to be Eric Bischoff to the shock of many fans around the wrestling world. At this point, there was no Montreal screw job, nor was there an evil Vince McMahon in WWF. Eric Bischoff's turn from mild-mannered announcer into an on-screen mastermind and maniacal cohort of WCW's biggest enemies revolutionised the way in which pro wrestling was presented forever. With his now complete turn to the dark side, Eric Bischoff gave the WCW wrestlers an ultimatum. They must either give up their allegiance to WCW and join the NWO, or become the next targets of the faction and face annihilation. At this time, the next phase of the group began with the likes of Big Bubba Rogers, Scott Norton, VK Wall Street and Buff Bagwell, all choosing the black and white t-shirt over the idea of being left black and blue from a beating. Re-emerging as a beloved figure, Ric Flair played a pivotal role in the New World Order's invasion storyline that captivated audiences in late 1996 and throughout 1997. As a central figure, Flair, along with the other members of the Four Horsemen, was at the forefront of the conflict against the NWO's key figures, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash and Hollywood Hulk Hogan. Flair wasted no time in challenging Hogan for the WCW World Heavyweight Belt at Clash of the Champions, though he won the match only by disqualification. In a surprising turn of events, in September of 1996, Flair and Arn Anderson joined forces with their long-standing adversaries, Sting and Lex Luger. However, their alliance was unsuccessful, as they were defeated by the NWO team, which included Hogan, Nash, Hall, and an imposter Sting, in the War Games match of Fall Brawl. The match concluded with Luger submitting to the imposter Sting's Scorpion Deathlock. Flair, impressed by Jarrett, supported this move, despite the reluctance of the other Horsemen members. Flair's decision to officially induct Jarrett into the group in February of 1997 created internal tensions, leading to Jarrett's eventual expulsion by Flair himself in July, due to the instability his presence had caused within the group. The year 1997 also saw Flair embroiled in feuds with several wrestlers, including Roddy Piper, Six, and his old rival Kurt Hennig. A bash at the beach in 1996, when Nash and Hall were set to take on Lex Luger, Randy Savage and Sting, the Outsiders were at a numbers disadvantage and promised to reveal the third man of their trio. In one of the most shocking and memorable moments in all of pro wrestling history, they teamed with Hulk Hogan and formed the formidable faction, the New World Order. The newly formed trio defeated the good guys when Hogan landed a leg drop on Randy Savage and covered him with what many considered to be an incredibly disrespectful manner. I did everything for the kids. In the reception I got... When I came out here, you fans can stick it, brother. This from the man who's soon to be seen portraying Santa at Christmas time. Now he spray paints, spits, defiles, and beats up anyone in his path. The leg drop and Hulk Hogan go way back. 
The leg drop stayed as part of Hogan's finish to matches throughout his entire career. He must have punched his opponent, pointed at them and dropped the leg a thousand times. But that night at Bash at the Beach in 1996, the leg drop signified more than just a victory for the Hulkster over Randy Savage. As his leg landed on the macho man's chest, it ushered in a new age for the entire pro wrestling industry. World wrestling champ Hulk Hogan's career could now be aptly titled The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Our E! cameras caught up with the new Hollywood Hulk Hogan and his band of vigilantes who call themselves the NWO or the New World Order. Stone Cold Steve Austin spoke on the incident, saying, I was watching this with my guys before the show, Austin said. I said, hey man, that's disrespect, am I right? Tell me about the cover. For some people, they don't get this, but when you make a cover in that position, it's almost like, dude, you're supposed to be here, and here I am with a little something extra. I said, dude, he's too high and not close to Savage's body. This pushed WCW to continued success in the famed Monday Night Wars in the mid to late 90s, helping WCW triumph from the 6th of June for 83 weeks in a row. The reaction of the crowd that night on the pay-per-view told us something different was happening. The anti-hero became the hero, and that was a direct parallel to what was happening in society, and so much of that night was unpredictable. But seemingly, the massive success of the NWO wasn't enough for Hogan, who claimed that it was in fact his idea to form the trio and turn heel at the time. Hogan stated, I originally came up with the idea for the New World Order group in WCW, but I wanted it to be Brutus Beefcake, the Nasty Boys and myself. Over the past six years, Eric Bischoff has become one of the most powerful, influential men in professional wrestling. Eric Bischoff heavily disputed this claim. I was over there kind of studying what worked over there and the differences between the way the product was presented in Japan and here in the States. And one of the things I noticed is it was so much more real there. The storylines, the characters, the action in the ring was more reality-based. And here in the United States, it was more character, kind of comedy cartoonish. And in studying it, I was kind of watching the intercompany wars and that kind of thing, and that's where the ideas started. Scott Hall also disagrees with Hogan's claim, saying, We had no idea who it was going to be. The whole third guy thing came up by accident. We wanted it to be Hulk, but Hulk had creative control in his contract, so he didn't have to do anything he didn't want to. We went to the ring. We hadn't even met Hulk yet. I met him briefly at WrestleMania 9, but I didn't know Hulk. We actually went to the ring in Daytona, and Hogan wasn't even there yet. He was on a jet flying cross-country from shooting a movie. Bischoff wanted it to be Hulk, but before we went out, Bischoff told us, if Hulk doesn't show up, I'm going to send out Sting. Kevin Nash also remembers things slightly differently to Hulk. It was actually Eric's idea. Eric pitched it to me. He came out to Scottsdale, Arizona and pitched the idea. I remember them doing something similar in Japan, but it wasn't that big of a deal. It was effective, but it wasn't to what the NWO became. So I said, okay. The NWO's appearance in WCW were so believable to some that WWF filed a lawsuit against their rivals stating, TBS proposed inter-promotional matches in order to associate WCW with WWF. Even though Eric Bischoff had clearly stated that Nash and Hall were no longer signed to WWF and even asked at Bash on the Beach, are you employed by the WWE? to Kevin Nash, to which he responded with a resounding no. The lawsuit dragged on for some time after the NWO's debut and was eventually settled out of court. WCW's focus on utilising older, well-known wrestlers rather than promoting younger talent, hindered the development of new headline performers. This approach prioritised short-term gains, resulted in a lack of innovation and freshness in their offerings. The first thing was, it was a split locker room. I mean, that was as clear as day from day one. It was very political. The top guys were doing everything in their power to keep the mid-tier guys down, and if you championed the mid-card guys, the main guys wanted to cut your throat. It was a political battlefield, bro. 
Just a political battlefield, I don't make excuses. I knew what I was getting into, bro, but I don't think I knew the degree. I don't think I really knew how serious it was. And with all of these big names and huge egos came even larger contracts. During his tenure in WCW from 1996 to 2000, Hulk Hogan earned a substantial income with the exception of 1999 where, unfortunately for him, he only earned an approximate $477,000. In the other years though, Hogan's compensation was significantly higher, totaling around $13 million over a five-year period. Hogan stood out as the top earning superstar in the promotion with his salary nearly doubling that of his closest peers. Nevertheless, other prominent wrestlers like Goldberg, Sting and Kevin Nash also received substantial monthly incomes. But it wasn't just the company's top stars that were getting paid millions of dollars. Eric Bischoff talked about signing Dustin Rhodes to his WCW roster contract back in 1999 and revealed the amount of money that WCW spent on Dustin despite creative having nothing for him. Bischoff stated that Rhodes was given a $50,000 signing bonus and earned $500,000 his first year, $600,000 his second, and $700,000 in his third and final year of his WCW contract. A June 28, 1999 report in the Atlanta Business Chronicle indicated WCW officials' expectations of generating $500 million in revenue for that year, highlighting WCW's popularity at the time. For context, its main rival, WWF, with a profit of $69 million, reported revenues of $373 million in 1999. Assuming WCW maintained a similar profit margin to WWF's 18.5%, their projected profits would have been around $92 million. In 1999, WCW, had it been an independent entity and not part of Time Warner, and achieved these projections, might have had an estimated value of around $3 billion. However, by 2000, WCW reported a loss of $62 million, mitigated somewhat by reducing its roster. The company had been spending heavily on contracts that year, with 157 wrestlers earning over 10 grand. While massive salaries for stars like Goldberg and Hulk Hogan could be justified, others like Brian Clark were paid significantly for limited appearances. Ernest Miller earned 318 grand despite losing many matches, and Chris Benoit, recognised for his skills prior to the tragic events of June 2007, earned over $300,000. Meanwhile, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, whose impact on the business was questionable at the time, received $180,000, and Barry Windham, a former world champion past his prime, was paid $358,000. After initially offering Hennig a spot in the Four Horsemen, a dramatic betrayal unfolded at Full Brawl in September of 1997. Hennig turned against Flair and the Horsemen, assaulting Flair by slamming a cage door onto his head a shocking and memorable moment in the ongoing saga of the Four Horsemen and the NWO. The match that we built up with you and Hogan at Starcade. The finish of that match is one that's been discussed and debated and... Eric Bischoff said on the Starcade 97 main event, we knew what the finish we wanted was before we even got to the building. We knew before we got on a plane. We knew about it months in advance. We knew we wanted Sting to go over. How he went over, he had to go over strong. He had to end the story exactly how the audience wanted it to end, on the highest note possible. That was the finish going in. This one's a little strange, but allow me to explain. 18 months is a long time in pro wrestling, but a year and a half is what the initial meeting between Sting and Hulk Hogan deserved. A slow, drawn-out story which would have fans captivated every week, reaching a peak at WCW's biggest show of the year, and the end of the storyline which would live long in the memory, which it does, for all the wrong reasons. Hell, I was the one that had to say, was that a fast count? That was a fast count. I thought it was going to be a fast count. What the fuck's going on? Sting and Hulk Hogan were the two franchise guys, and the franchise guys were butting heads over what was going to happen. One guy came up to me and told me to fast count to give him some heat and give him an out, while the other guy said, don't fast count it, just keep it nice and slow. I think if we'd have just kept with the game plan and done what, what we had all agreed on, 
things would have been a lot different. Dick Patrick, established WCW wrestling referee, admitted that Hulk spoke to him and rigged a part of a match between him and Sting at Starcade 97. The ref was asked by Hogan to make the pin count as slow as possible, making Sting look weak after the beating he'd received and the loss from Hogan. Eric Bischoff wanted there to be a fast count so that Sting would look strong in defeat and further add to the idea that the referee was on the side of Hogan and the NWO all along, and Nick Patrick got caught right in the middle. The person in charge didn't want to make a call. He didn't want to decide. It was a year-long plan, and it was in motion, and that day, suddenly it, it wasn't in motion like it was anymore. Interrupting Hogan's celebrations, a debuting Bret Hart made his way to the ring and explained the referee's fast count was illegal, declaring himself the ref and making the match restart fairly. It seems pretty straightforward by pro wrestling standards, if not a bit crazy by the real world standards. Until we listen to Nick Patrick and find out that he was instructed to make a normal speed count, a fast count and a slow count by different people backstage and didn't know what to do, resulting in the original pin from Hogan to Sting at a normal paced call, thus making Brett's interruption seem like a villainous move and diminishing his esteem with the crowd. In this moment, Hogan shows how well he understands the subtleties of pro wrestling and how just a small difference in how a match plays out can have huge ramifications moving forward. He showed that he was willing to yet again go behind the back of the performer he was facing in the ring and make unagreed changes in order to make himself look better. As Starcade went off the air, the fans in the audience and at home were left confused. Bret Hart's debut felt oddly timed and lacklustre. Hogan, the villain, seemed like he had been screwed out of his victory, and Sting, the hero, even in victory with the WCW title around his waist, was the one doing all of the plotting. But I think it was due to all the chaos that happened, you know, the hours that, you know, of that day that led up to the match. Nothing felt right, and it led to weeks of uncertainty from the company. The controversy of the finish of the match continued on after the show, and the title belt was made vacant until Sting and Hogan could resolve the debate on who the true WCW champion was. Replays of the referee's count and Bret Hart's actions were played and discussed the following week on WCW television. The way in which the crowd had been so dissatisfied with the Hulk and Sting encounter meant WCW needed to attempt to rekindle the feud quickly. This led to a rematch at the Super Brawl pay-per-view on February the 22nd, 1998. Sting beat Hogan to win the WCW World Heavyweight title, a moment which was hard-earned and well-deserved by Sting. Lynchy known by various names including the slow process, was a gruesome method of torture and execution employed in China from around 900 CE until its prohibition in the early 1900s. In Ling Chi executions, a knife was systematically employed to remove body parts over an extended duration, inevitably leading to the victim's death. In this video, I'll examine how World Championship Wrestling a company which originally created the foundation for my lifelong love of pro wrestling, died a death by a thousand cuts, almost all of which were self-inflicted. By 1998, World Championship Wrestling was running into full gear and signing many famous faces from WWE's past and present roster. When Hulk Hogan's NWO needed a new faction to feud with, and that faction needed a recognisable name to front it, the Ultimate Warrior was given the call. However, the character seemingly still belonged to WWF and Titan Sports, who defended their ownership of the copyright. When I got back to work in WCW in 1998, the reason I went back as Warrior was because as soon as WWF got wind of the fact that I'd been approached by WCW to go to work there, they filed a motion to stop it, saying that I didn't own the rights to the character to be able to do that. The lawsuit didn't start as a thing about who owns the rights to anything or me changing my name to Warrior so I can continue to be a wrestler. That's all just silly stuff. That's just all urban legends that have been out for years. It started as a breach of contract. So they filed a motion to say that I couldn't do that and what I did was I went and proved because of my performances in the business as Dingo Warrior that I did own those. 
and the judge agreed that I did. The look, the style, the initial beginnings of Warrior, of Ultimate Warrior as he eventually became, certainly started with Dingo Warrior. Vince had Pat Patterson and Bruce Pritchard file false affidavits saying that they came up with the Ultimate, which is another one of those urban legends that isn't true. They didn't. I came up with it. My first promo I did, my first television appearance in Green Bay, Wisconsin, down in a little studio room when I was cutting a promo about what I was. I said, I'm not this kind of warrior. I'm not that kind of warrior. I am the ultimate warrior. That's why today I have ultimate too, because it all came out of the settlement of the trial of the litigation. Famously appearing as a figment of Hulk Hogan's imagination in a wacky segment featuring a two-way mirror, the feud culminated in a match between the two at the Halloween Havoc pay-per-view event in 1998, which was widely regarded as a disappointment due to Warrior's apparent lack of in-ring conditioning and the confusing storyline. His poor reception led Warrior to take his frustrations out on those backstage, never managing to find friends in the locker room. Warrior was weird. I didn't share a lot of conversations with him, but I remember when he came into WCW, he was referring to himself in third person around the boys. He was calling himself Warrior. He's talking about himself to the boys in conversation. Following the Halloween Havoc match, the Ultimate Warrior continued to make sporadic appearances in WCW, but never regained the momentum or popularity that he had enjoyed in his prime with WWF. He was often criticised for his limited in-ring ability and his inability to adapt to the changing style of professional wrestling in the late 90s. Almost all the wrestlers who knew the Warrior during this period struggled to find much pleasant to say about his attitude or work ethic. Warrior has since gone on to say that he feels he was only ever contracted to WCW in order for Hulk Hogan to get his win back as retribution for Warrior's success at WrestleMania. In 2000, The Ultimate Warrior was released from his WCW contract and although he would make a handful of appearances over the next 14 years for smaller wrestling shows, this effectively ended his career as a professional wrestler. Warrior's time in the public spotlight, however, had only just begun. The match that we built up with you and Hogan at Starcade. Imagine the Chicago Bulls telling Michael Jordan to go home. We don't need you anymore can't imagine? Well, WCW's president Eric Bischoff did just that last year when he attempted to end Ric Flair's career with a lawsuit. Charging breach of contract, the company sued the Nature Boy in April of 1998 for missing a scheduled TV appearance. It was like the Yankees suing Mickey Mantle, said Dave Meltzer, editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Flair, who later countersued, was deeply hurt. He said, he had permission to miss the show to watch his son Reed, who was then 10 years old, compete in a national AAU wrestling tournament. It was time to take a stand, Flair said. I wasn't going to let my son down. Instead of letting the incident blow over, Flair said, Bischoff decided to take it to the next level. Fortunately for Flair, his supporters rebelled. Chants of We Want Flair filled arenas across the country and protests were sent to WCW offices. Finally, in September, the two sides settled out of court. Flair, with a three-year, $2 million contract in hand, was going to continue what he does best, entertaining the fans. Scott Hall's career was marked by unfulfilled potential, hindered by personal struggles and substance abuse. He deserved so much better than he got when he moved to WCW. Hall's challenges with alcohol were well known at the time, and in a controversial move, WCW incorporated this into his on-screen character, in 1998, amidst periods of rehab and struggles with alcoholism, WCW portrayed Scott Hall as an alcoholic on television, often appearing intoxicated and with a drink in his hand. This portrayal happened during a difficult phase in Hall's life, with his struggles broadcasted to millions every Monday night. His on-screen appearances included slurred speech and instances of vomiting, with commentators expressing increased disdain with each incident. The way in which the crowd had been so dissatisfied with the Hulk and Sting encounter meant WCW needed to attempt to rekindle the feud quickly. This led to a rematch at the Super Brawl pay-per-view on February the 22nd, 1998. Sting beat Hogan to win the WCW World Heavyweight title, a moment which was hard-earned and well-deserved by Sting. Following Hogan's lead, many former superstars of the World Wrestling Federation, like the Macho Man Randy Savage, enjoyed new success in the WCW. 
Vince McMahon was going for younger wrestlers at the time. You know, he was going with a new generation theme, nothing more than that. You know, and uh, I was uh, doing announcing for him over there, and I just still wanted to be participating. In December of 1998, at Starcade, Kevin Nash faced off against Goldberg and challenged him for his WCW World Heavyweight title. Goldberg was at the pinnacle of one of the greatest and most contested winning streaks in modern wrestling history. Whether you believe Goldberg's streak was real, or in fact the numbers were inflated in true pro wrestling style, there's no doubt that Goldberg's phenomenal burst onto the scene made him into an instant star. During the match, Scott Hall appeared dressed as a member of the staff in the arena and jumped up onto the apron. Shockingly, pun intended, Scott had with him a taser, and he zapped Goldberg whilst the referee and both Nash and Goldberg were distracted. This left Big Kevin with the chance to pin his downed adversary and end the streak, becoming the WCW champion in the process. Fans, including myself at the time, were disappointed in the way in which Goldberg was seemingly cheated out of his title and prestigious streak. But it's unquestionable that the actions witnessed on that night created long-lasting and iconic pro wrestling moments. The wrestling world was eager to see what would happen in the presumed rematch. One month later in January, the stage was set for Kevin Nash to defend his newly obtained gold, this time without the help of Scott Hall. Fans were clamouring to see their favourite and Goldberg put the record straight and reclaim what many believed was still deservedly his. So, when we tuned into Monday Nitro to see the match, you can imagine how disappointed I felt when another NWO scheme had got in the way. Members conspired to have Goldberg detained and thus unable to compete, leaving a path for the returning Hogan to face off for the title against Nash. Hulk Hogan was one of my least favourite wrestlers in WCW. I also hated all forms of the NWO. I was seven. Of course I wanted to cheer on who I perceived as the good guys. So instead of getting to see Nash destroyed at the hands of the rather exciting Goldberg, I was stuck watching two wrestlers who I didn't much care for in a match I didn't really want to see. However, as many of you probably already realised, things for little chubby seven-year-old me were about to go from bad to much, much worse. Hogan poked Nash with a single finger. Nash collapsed in an over-the-top and theatrical fashion, and the crowd's palpable excitement is popped. The fans drop their arms and open their mouths in confusion. Some of them probably didn't see the quick flick of the pinky from Hogan, and those who did were surely not aware of why it had caused such a reaction from Nash. Before anyone had time to process what they had just seen, Hogan laid upon his downed opponent and claimed victory in the WCW title. A few hardcore Hogan fans celebrated briefly amongst a crowd of bewilderment. As Scott Hall and Scott Steiner climbed into the ring, Nash and Hogan regained their feet. All four men hug in celebration as it becomes clear that the men were all in on this together. I could not have been more unhappy with this outcome as a child. Even with the explanations coming from commentary, I was confused. I could not work out what had just happened, which made me upset. A moment which would go down in infamy as one of the most controversial occurrences in all of pro wrestling history broke my seven-year-old brain. Now in hindsight, I can see it as both one of the most brilliant pieces of storytelling in order to create hatred towards a set of characters, and also a moment which fundamentally undermines the entire foundation of the pro wrestling industry. It was a clear reminder to children around the world that nothing you see within the ring in WCW was spontaneous, with the combat being choreographed and every story scripted. Whatever you feel about the finger poke of doom, it's hard for me to think of a more memorable moment from my time watching WCW in the UK as a kid. For me, no matter how much mental anguish it caused me when I was younger, it will forever be iconic because of that. This began with Conan's music video in late 98, followed by the Beach Brawl Battle Royal on MTV in March of 99. This led to collaborations with various musical groups, including Megadeth, The Insane Clown Posse, The No Limit Soldiers, The Misfits, and even Kiss, which introduced the character of the Demon. It may have worked in 1985, during WWF's Rock and Wrestling Connection, but times had changed. 
These musical features were aimed at drawing attention, but they often alienated viewers who were not fans of these bands or just wanted to watch wrestling when they put on a wrestling show, leading them to switch over to watching Raw instead. A notable instance was when KISS performed on Nitro on August the 23rd, 1999, resulting in the show's rating falling below 3.0 for the first time in over a year and way below Raw. Kurt Hennig, renowned for his exceptional athleticism in professional wrestling, however, his time in WCW saw him not receiving the spotlight he deserved. The year 99 is a prime example of this. Hennig initially found himself relegated to the less prominent black and white faction of NWO. Then, without clear reasoning, he was abruptly removed from the group. Following this, Hennig teamed up with Barry Windham. Together, they captured the WCW World Tag Team titles, but they were soon part of the West Texas Rednecks, along with Kendall Windham, Bobby Duncan Jr. and Curly Bill or Virgil. The West Texas Rednecks are best remembered for their two music videos, Rap is Crap and Good Old Boys. This gimmick was poorly received and served to underscore WCW's failure to effectively utilise their top talent, including Hennig. Mr. Perfect wasn't the only wrestler who didn't fully realise their potential within WCW's ranks, although he managed to secure the title once again in 96. By the end of 1998, the Giants' role had diminished, relegating him to a more secondary position. Despite his size and presence, it appeared that Kevin Nash received more prominent billing as a big man, even though the Giant was arguably more athletic. After being ousted from the NWO in early 1999, the Giant allowed his WCW contract to lapse. Paul White then emerged in WWE as The Big Show, debuting at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre on February the 14th of 1999, during the main event between Vince McMahon and Stone Cold Steve Austin. While The Big Show had periods in WWE where he was used in lesser roles, his status as a major wrestling star is undeniable. WCW's loss of Big Show in February was a significant blow, marking the beginning of a series of challenges that the company would face with its roster. Chris Jericho's exceptional talent was evident during his time in WCW. However, for reasons unclear, WCW did not capitalise on his potential as they should have. In 1998, Jericho developed an engaging character and a compelling conspiracy storyline, setting the stage for a potential showdown with Goldberg. This momentum seemed poised to propel him to stardom later that year. Despite these promising developments, WCW's management limited Jericho to a mid-card role, failing to elevate him to the higher echelons of the roster. This oversight became particularly apparent on August the 8th, when Jericho made a significant impact during his debut in WWE. He appeared by boldly interrupting a promo from The Rock, immediately establishing himself as a major star in the company. Vince Russo's style of Crash TV always exemplified the idea of living fast and dying young. Working seven days a week and flying all over the country during one of the most chaotic and intense periods in pro wrestling history would be enough to burn out anyone. Well, almost anyone. Vince McMahon, as we all know, is a freak of nature. He doesn't eat, sleep or stand still, and those around him have always been expected to match his attitude and pace at work. This led to several times where Vince Russo felt burnt out and emotionally drained. The reason why I left the WWE was, I'm a dad, I'm Italian. When Vince McMahon had just added Smackdown to our schedule, never spoke to us about it, and to me and Ed Ferrara, it was a big deal, because we took great pride in writing Raw. Now, all of a sudden, you're telling us to write another show, and we don't want to water down our work. So I went into Vince's office, and we had a heart-to-heart, -heart, and I said, Vince, listen, I'm not seeing my family at home. My wife is raising my family by herself. I wanted my wife to be able to move my family to her hometown. I said, Vince, if I have to fly back to see them on the weekends, Evansville, Indiana. I said, if I just have to fly there, but my wife is literally raising my three kids on her own. And bro, I'll never forget, without blinking an eye, he looked me straight in the eye and said, Vince, I don't understand what the problem is. Why don't you hire a nanny to watch your kids? I'm paying you enough. Bro, I'm telling you. As soon as the words came out of his mouth, game was over. He told me right then and there, I don't give a shit about you, I don't give a shit about your family, the company is first, get a nanny, game over. In October of 99, Russo was replaced by Chris Kresge as WWF head writer after Russo departed the company. So, I immediately, I had some people at WCW, I had Jeff Jarrett, I had Kevin Nash, I had a couple of people down there, they hooked me up with JJ Dillon. 
I flew down to WCW that weekend. Now, you gotta understand, I knew the minute I got on that plane to go to Atlanta, I was working for WCW. By March of 1998, WCW's rivals were beginning to make Stone Cold Steve Austin their main star. With this change, brought with it increased viewership and higher ticket sales, something which directly damaged the bottom line of executives inside World Championship Wrestling. To fight back against the momentum beginning to gather inside of WWF, decision makers at WCW pushed Monday Nitro to three hours in order to sell more advertising slots. The biggest night on TV is getting bigger. Raw is now three hours every Monday at 8. This three-hour show has since been preferred by WWE in the modern day, a change which many of the show's detractors online say is a leading issue in the declining quality of WWE's weekly shows in the modern era. And even back then, going from a two to three hour weekly show caused a steady but noticeable decline in quality as the material in each program was either spread thin to accommodate the longer time slot or in many cases simply meant that WCW were forced to present fans with lower quality matches to fill the time. This was an issue which was only worsened when WCW executives decided to add another show to their weekly lineup. On Thursday nights, they would display their brand new Thunder show in August with the idea that eventually the NWO would grow large enough in order to create a second roster to fill out Thunder's airtime. During this comeback, Flair notably reassembled the Four Horsemen, bringing together Steve McMichael, Dean Malenko and Chris Benoit to revive the iconic group. Following his return, Flair engaged in a prolonged feud with Eric Bischoff. This rivalry was marked by several intense encounters, including Flair frequently targeting Bischoff's eyes. The feud reached a peak at Starcade in December of 98, where Flair and Bischoff faced off in a match. Bischoff emerged victorious thanks to interference from Kurt Hennig, a former horseman. The storyline continued to escalate the next night on Nitro in Baltimore, where Flair in a dramatic twist, threatened to leave the company. He demanded a match against Bischoff with high stakes, the presidency of the WCW. Despite interference from the New World Order in Bischoff's favour, Flair won the match, securing the position as president of the company. Eric Bischoff's turn from mild-mannered announcer into an on-screen mastermind and maniacal cohort of WCW's biggest enemies revolutionised the way in which pro wrestling was presented forever. With his now complete turn to the dark side, Eric Bischoff gave the WCW wrestlers an ultimatum. They must either give up their allegiance to WCW and join the NWO, or become the next targets of the faction and face annihilation. At this time, the next phase of the group began with the likes of Big Bubba Rogers, Scott Norton, VK Wall Street and Buff Bagwell all choosing the black and white t-shirt over the idea of being left black and blue from a beating. Eric Bischoff, a polarising figure in the wrestling industry, played a pivotal role in WCW's rise to success. He was instrumental in launching Monday Nitro, developing innovative pay-per-view concepts and assembling the influential NWO faction. By 1999, however, Bischoff's role had shifted. In the WCW storyline, he was no longer the on-screen president, a position now held by Ric Flair. Bischoff transitioned to a subordinate role, experiencing a dramatic change in his character, including getting his head shaved and later reappearing with grey hair, alternating between executive and announcer duties. Behind the scenes, Bischoff faced significant challenges in managing WCW, especially during the ultra-competitive Attitude Era. Under these constraints, Bischoff struggled to produce a show that could consistently rival WWE, ultimately leading to his departure from the company. This marked the beginning of Vince Russo's tenure, notably the last episode of Nitro under Bischoff's management nearly surpassed Raw in ratings and was the final episode to achieve a rating above 4. Vince Russo's time at World Championship Wrestling is often remembered as a contentious and detrimental era in the company's history. He moved to WCW in 1999, and it came at a critical time, with many believing his actions significantly contributed to the company's eventual downfall. 
By this point, WWF had secured a dominant position in the wrestling industry, and the intense pace and success led to both Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara feeling overwhelmed and less challenged than before. As Russo was not under contract with WWF, he explored opportunities elsewhere and initiated discussions with WCW officials. WCW, eager to regain its footing in the wrestling world, saw Russo as a key figure behind its rival's success and was keen on bringing him on board. They paraded everybody in there. You talk about a horse and pony show. I knew they were not going to let me leave Atlanta without signing a contract. When Vince Russo called Ed Ferrara to let him know what he was going to do, Ferrara knew that this would be bad for him. If Russo leaves the WWF, everything is going to fall on my lap. Everything, everything, everything. Well, if they want me to, they can have me. On October 3rd, 1999, Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara signed to WCW. The pair were put in creative control of a company that seemed ready to get back on top. I don't know how Russo flim-flammed WCW by saying, Hey, I'm the guy who made Vince McMahon. You have to hire me. I need to run your company. On October the 18th, 1999, Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara began their work on making WCW great again, and they had a straightforward method to cure their ailing promotion. The formula consisted of three main goals. 1. Bring Crash TV style to WCW. Russo was known for a writing style that emphasised shock value, often at the expense of long-term storytelling and character development. This approach, while initially boosting ratings in the WWE, did not translate well to the WCW audience, who were accustomed to a different style of wrestling presentation. 2. Phase out the older stars. During this time, Ed and I were concentrating on breaking down the old foundation that was in place and building a new one as we saw fit. 3. Give younger, underutilised or misused talent more opportunities. While at WCW, Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara developed a character called Oklahoma, played by Ferrara himself. This character was a direct and satirical imitation of Jim Ross, who was a highly esteemed commentator in WWE at the time and had previously worked for a long time in WCW. During our creative meetings, Ed would do a JR impression and it would pop Vince like every time. I have to remind myself, that was the environment back then. No punches were pulled. The portrayal of Oklahoma in WCW not only mimicked Jim Ross's unique style of commentary and his cowboy hat, but also insensitively parodied his Bell's palsy, a medical condition affecting his facial muscles. This element of the character was widely criticised for being inconsiderate and disrespectful. I mean, JR couldn't help it, could he? I swear to God, bro, there was a part of us where it was really an innocent jab at JR, but it's like, okay, Vince, you used to laugh at this, now we're on the other side and we are kind of putting it in your face. The issue wasn't the heat from the fans or the competition, it was the hurtful words and how they made JR feel. Numerous individuals in the wrestling community regarded this parody as highly inappropriate and offensive. The portrayal was perceived as a direct and personal affront to Jim Ross, a figure widely admired for his professionalism and significant contributions to the wrestling industry. We never looked at how this was going to affect JR, because that's what we never looked at, because that's the last thing we wanted to do was hurt that guy which we did. That atmosphere and the environment, that's what really led to the Oklahoma character. Because again, people will believe whatever the hell they want to believe about me. I don't really give a shit what they think anymore. But the reality of it is, I did not have heat with JR. The response from fans was predominantly unfavourable. Although wrestling is known for its controversial and bold themes, the act of ridiculing a real individual's medical condition was viewed as a step too far for many spectators. This approach was criticised as being needlessly harsh and mean-spirited, instead of providing entertainment. Bro, I worked in a sea of sharks. I worked in a world of liars and con men and carnies that would do whatever they had to do to get ahead. They would lie, they would beg, they would steal, and they had no moral compass. JR was the one guy that was always 100% honest with me to my face, nothing behind my back. No political posturing, none of that. That was almost impossible at the level he was at, none of that. That's why I love the guy to this day. This episode significantly tarnished the reputation of Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara amongst many wrestling fans and professionals within the wrestling community. Their portrayal of the Oklahoma character, a caricature of one of wrestling's most beloved figures, this incident 
highlights the questionable creative decisions during Russo's time in WCW and contributed to the increasing dissatisfaction with WCW's programming. It stands as a stark reminder of how wrestling storylines, in their quest for shock value or ratings, can sometimes overstep ethical and moral lines. Ed Ferraro and Vince Russo bought an array of complex and often illogical storylines and gimmicks to WCW with them. These storylines, perceived by many fans and critics as convoluted and lacking the clarity and depth of more traditional wrestling narratives, were always a point of contention. Additionally, Russo's insistence on being an on-screen character and participating in significant matches added to this controversy. A notable instance occurred on June the 5th of 2000, when Russo entered a steel cage match against Ric Flair, one of the most celebrated wrestlers in the company's history. Confronted by the dirtiest player in the game, Russo was visibly intimidated. The match was intense, with Flair dominating and tearing Russo's shirt off. The situation escalated as Ric's son, David Flair, emerged from under the ring, only to be overpowered by his father. In a dramatic turn, Russo grabbed a ladder, opened a section of the cage and ascended to the top. Followed closely by Flair, their confrontation continued 20 feet above the ring, and as they climbed back down, Ric Flair applied the figure four leg lock, seemingly close to victory. At this point, it's worth taking a moment to reflect, I think. We've witnessed the show's lead writer, far from a professional wrestler, engaged in a main event steel cage match against a true wrestling legend capable of overwhelming him in reality. We've seen Ric Flair, the genuine wrestler, enter the match accompanied by two of his kids, Beth and Reed. Meanwhile, another one of his children mysteriously emerged from beneath the ring to meddle in the match. This scenario, though wildly bizarre, strangely aligns with the eccentricities of late 90s wrestling. I can kind of get behind it. However, the match's conclusion took an even more surreal turn. Just as Russo seems on the verge of submitting to one of the most iconic submission moves in all of pro wrestling, a cascade of red paint and oil suddenly drenched the ring, creating a shocking, blood-like spectacle. This chaos allowed David Flair to attack his father once again, leading to a soaked Russo scoring a pinfall victory. This moment left me bewildered when I first saw it years ago as a kid. Time has passed, but my confusion persists. And even as I recount this to you now, like a drop of fake blood on a fresh white shirt, that feeling of bewilderment hasn't faded a bit. On July the 9th, 2000, a significant event in wrestling history unfolded during the WCW Bash at the Beach event, marking Booker T's first WCW World Championship win. The outcome emerged from a complex and controversial scenario involving Hulk Hogan, Jeff Jarrett and Vince Russo. Earlier in the evening, a staged incident had occurred. This involved Hogan and Jarrett where Jarrett was scripted to deliberately lose to Hogan. Russo's out there, he's got the belt and leaning on the apron, no big deal. I figure he's being a prick because he's mad as hell at me. Jarrett walks out and is walking around, I think he's work. I came out, the roar is electric, the loudest pop of the night. I do the ear thing just to stick it up Russo's ass and show how over I was. Two or three times, Jarrett doesn't get in the ring. I think he's working the crowd and we're going to tear the place down. I got them right in the palm of my hand. When you have them like that, you can fart in the ring and the place will go crazy. Not like pulling teeth with Billy Kidman where you have to work your ass off and there's no reaction. This son of a bitch gets in the ring and lays down. Russo looks at me, climbs on the apron. Fuck you, Hogan. He throws the belt at me. I look down at Jarrett. Is this a rib? Why are they doing this? Jeff goes, you always told me to do what I have to do. He's laying in the middle of the ring and I'm talking to him. Get up and wrestle, let's stick it up this guy's ass. You're one of the boys. You've always said to do what I have to do. I'm doing what I have to do. You're a fucking piece of shit. The incident was designed to shock and intrigue fans, much like previous wrestling storylines, but it backfired. Instead of generating excitement, it alienated many fans who were upset with the blatant blending of real-life disputes into the wrestling narrative. I put my foot on him, they countered it, I took the belt, walked to the back, and said F him. Here comes Russo, he pops up on the monitor. I scream, get Nick, Hogan's son, out of here. I was going to go kill Russo and I didn't want him to see it. Dellinger saw me get my kids out of the building, so he knew I was up to something. I'm waiting for that son of a bitch to come back and I'm going to unload on him. Half of Russo's boys are watching his back. 
I'm not going to drop any names, but I saw I had people on my left side watching me. Dellinger grabbed me. Terry, get out of here. No, I've got something I have to say. It's not worth the lawsuit, get out of here. Leading to a significant drop in viewership and fan engagement. This event, broadcast live on Nitro, was marred by convoluted rule changes, overbooking and a generally chaotic execution. The complexity began with the requirement for the face team members to secure their spots through qualifying matches earlier that night, while the hill team was allowed to arbitrarily add a member during the match. Additionally, tag teams Chronic and the Harris brothers entered the match together, disrupting the usual participant balance. A significant departure from the traditional Wargames format was the introduction of ladder match rules, where the objective was to retrieve a prize from atop a three-tiered cage, a structure that had become a staple in WCW. This replaced the classic double ring, double cage setup. The winner had to not only retrieve the belt from the top, but also successfully exit the bottom cage with it. This iteration of Wargames strayed far from what fans had traditionally expected from this iconic match type. The 2000 version saw erratic developments, such as Ernest Miller losing his match spot but participating anyway, only to be quickly eliminated by Kevin Nash. Nash himself was involved in a bewildering segment too, where he appeared to betray his Hill teammates, only to reveal it as a ruse. Why? Booker T initially retrieved the title, and Goldberg nearly emerged as the new champion. However, Bret Hart, who was not actually an official participant, intervened by slamming the cage door on Goldberg's head. This action allowed Nash to win and retain the title, adding to his history of controversial moments in WCW. The match was not only difficult to follow, but also suffered from a fundamental flaw, the concept of two teams competing for a prize that only one individual could claim. While the Hill team had a somewhat coherent goal of aiding Kevin Nash, the face team faced the intricate challenge of battling their opponents whilst also pursuing their individual championship aspirations. This complexity and lack of clarity contributed to Wargames 2000 being considered one of the worst WCW pay-per-views of all time. This happened in a highly debated and infamous episode of Monday Nitro due to the unexpected turn of events, with the title passing to someone behind the scenes. Of course, he was incapable of taking on one of the company's biggest stars toe to toe. I was out there in front of the people, I was cutting promos, I was in angles. Me personally, that was the worst part of my job, because it really took away from my writing and my producing. It really did. The match concluded with Goldberg delivering a spear to Vince Russo, propelling him through the steel cage wall. This unintentional exit allowed Russo to claim victory and the world title. However, as an eight-year-old viewer, this outcome was disappointing. It seemed to diminish the stature of the actual wrestlers, portraying them as less competent and weaker. Additionally, it placed Vince Russo, the show's writer, at the forefront of the main event. This focus on Russo overshadowed the more deserving and skilled wrestlers in the company, spotlighting him instead of the talented stars, who traditionally should have been at the centre of such high-profile matches. World Championship Wrestling has become known for experimenting with unique and sometimes outlandish match concepts, especially during the late 90s and very early 2000s. Among these were the notorious honor pole matches, which involved placing an object on a pole in the corner of the ring. The first wrestler to retrieve the item would win the match or gain a specific advantage by using whatever was hanging there. These matches are often associated with Vince Russo's tenure in the company and they were characterised by their unusual stipulations and often comedic or absurd nature. Viagra on a pole match, perhaps one of the most infamous on a pole matches of all time, this involved a bottle of Viagra being placed on a pole at ringside. The match was between Billy Kidman and Shane Douglas on an episode of Nitro. The idea was to play off Douglas's storyline issues with Kidman and add a comedic if somewhat, if somewhat silly element to the feud. Judy Bagwell on a forklift match Another unusual event was the Judy Bagwell on a forklift at the New Blood Rising pay-per-view in 2000. Buff Bagwell's mother, Judy, was literally placed on a forklift at ringside. The match involving Buff Bagwell and Chris Canyon was a twist on the traditional on a pole match and added a bizarre family dynamic to the story. The San Francisco 49ers match or not exactly an on-the-pole match, this match involved boxes hanging from poles in each corner of the ring, one of which contained the WCW World title. The bout which took place between Booker T and Jeff Jarrett was criticised for its randomness and lack of coherence. 
a pinata on a pole match. This match featured a pinata filled with money suspended from a pole. Obviously, the match was part of a series that stereotypically portrayed Latino wrestlers, and it was criticised for both its concept and cultural insensitivity. Leather jacket on a pole. This was a match where, as you guessed it, a leather jacket was the object to be retrieved from a pole. Such matches often involved personal items or symbols of a wrestler's persona or storyline. These on a pole matches were often criticised for several reasons. They were seen as relying too heavily on gimmicks at the expense of traditional wrestling storytelling and athleticism. Some of the concepts stretched the boundaries of believability and absurdity, detracting from the sport's legitimacy. The frequent use of honor pole matches at this time led to a sense of overkill and reduced the novelty and impact of such stipulations. While these matches are remembered as part of World Championship Wrestling's unique history, they are often cited as examples of the creative excesses that contributed to the company's eventual decline and acquisition by WWE in 2001. Vince Russo frequently liked to use non-wrestlers in major storylines and matches during his time in WCW. The week of the show, in the creative meeting, the decision was made. The people in the booking meeting all thought the same. The goal was to get as many eyeballs as possible on the show. Everybody on the creative side was looking at it as a TV show rather than a wrestling show. I put the WWE title on Vince McMahon, the WCW title on David Arquette, and another WCW title on Eric Bischoff. Why? We are looking to create stories not for the wrestling fan, but for the casual wrestling fan. In 2000, David Arquette, known for his acting career, collaborated with WCW on several appearances. This partnership was part of a cross-promotional effort to promote the movie Ready to Rumble. Both WCW and Warner Brothers, the distributor of the film, were under the umbrella of Time Warner, facilitating the collaboration. Vince Russo saw the opportunity to leverage Arquette's popularity at the time during its rating battle with the WWF. As a devoted fan of pro wrestling, David Arquette had reservations about the storyline he was to be a part of in the company, which included him winning and defending the WCW World Heavyweight Championship, the organization's most esteemed title, in a pay-per-view main event. The storyline was met with negative reactions, and critics later labelled it as one of the worst moments in professional wrestling history. Furthermore, this crossover seemingly did nothing to boost the viewership of either Ready to Rumble, the film, or WCW, the wrestling brand. I went down to the bar and I'm sitting there, and I forgot the wrestler's last name, but his name was Hugh, and he came up to me and I said, Did you hear? I just won the championship. He said, Are you kidding me? I said, No, no. He says, This business. I hate this business. I can't believe this stupid business. And he, like, stormed off, and that was like the first cue that people were pissed about this. Russo's decision to have David Arquette win the World Heavyweight Championship might not have seemed like a wise move, particularly to wrestling traditionalists. While the ratings reflect a broader decline, Arquette's championship win seemed to indicate more frustration amongst dedicated wrestling fans than it did harm to WCW's already waning brand. Interestingly, although Russo was responsible for incorporating the title change into the storyline, it was apparently Tony Schiavone who originally came up with this terrible idea. Leading up to the uncensored show, Hogan and Randy Savage were embroiled in a game of one-upmanship. As each trying to show that they were the best wrestler in the NWO, this led to a steel cage match where the pair attempted to settle the score once and for all but no victor was declared on the night. After the match, Randy Savage declared that Hulk Hogan and his fellow NWO teammates were conspiring against the Macho Man. In the main event of Uncensored, Scott Hall attempted and failed to take Sting's WCW belt away from him. It was around this time that Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan began to show that their clear differences were beginning to have a strain on the group. When Hogan attacked Nash after they had wrestled as tag team partners, it was clear for the world to see. When it came time for Hulk to once again challenge for the NWO title, it was now held by his fellow group member and longtime rival Randy Savage. Are you guys good guys? Are you bad guys? Everyone's hitting everybody with chairs. Right, we're just whatever we are, just kind of like a rebel group of people. It's like Jesse James, Doc Holliday, Billy the Kid all banded together and uh, sometimes we get along and sometimes we don't. During the match, Kevin Nash came out to powerbomb Hogan as retribution for the Hulkster's recent blindside attack. 
But as Bret Hart managed to lay the limp Hogan's arm over the also seemingly unconscious Savage, Hogan won back his WCW title. At this moment, the first major fracture within the New World Order tore the entire group apart. These are the decisions made by the creative think tanks in wrestling. There's a brainstorming uh, that goes on for the first couple hours of a meeting, and then basically you've got to get down to nuts and bolts, and you've got to get something down, whether you want to call it in our business a script or what you're going to do, but basically there comes a time when the brainstorming has to stop, and bam. From his heyday in the 80s, Hulk Hogan says he's down 70 pounds, and now steroid-free, but that some of his fellow wrestlers are not. I don't think it'll ever go away completely as long as there's a competitive nature and any type of physicality and there's a competitive edge to be gained. I think whether it's legal or illegal, some people will cross that line or step up to that line to gain that advantage. Melanie Pillman says it was Hulk Hogan who told Brian he could obtain HGH from Dr. Edmund Chen at the Life Extension Institute. And a former wrestler who wished to remain anonymous says Hogan recommended Chen to many wrestlers. The NWA Wolfpack was during the Monday Night Wars. That was during a time the business with WWE and us was at its peak. That was a fun time. I have great memories of that. In April of 1998, Kevin Nash and Randy Savage came to the ring and were joined by Conan, Miss Elizabeth, Kurt Henning and Rick Rude. They were the NWO Wolfpack and would be identified by their classic NWO t-shirt instead of the classic white and black wore red instead. In 1998, the talk of the WCW wrestling fans was surrounding the ongoing feud between the NWO Red and Black Wolfpack and the original black and white Hollywood NWO. So, in order for NWO to have their own show and have their own roster to deep enough to sustain a two or at some point three hour show, there had to be more NWO members and eventually peel off and turn on the original NWO, and all that kind of storyline. I was building up the NWO roster so I could eventually have WCW on Thunder, NWO on Nitro, and have my two companies, so to speak, battling each other. Good idea? Bad idea? Doesn't matter at this point, but that was the idea. It's a very physical sport. It's, enter it's entertainment at its best, but at the same time, uh, sometimes you're expected to jump out of the grandstands into a Dixie Cup, you know, without water. From Vince Russo joining the company in 99 to the closure of the company, 29 different title reigns occurred, including a few vacancies. The longest reign during this time was Scott Steiner holding the belt for 120 days before losing it to Booker T on the final episode of Nitro, under Russo's direction, WCW saw an unprecedented number of title changes. This devalued the prestige of the belts and confused audiences. Some of the things that went wrong for WCW were giving creative control to a lot of the wrestlers, and some of the storylines were asinine. Some of the ideas were great, but it was a very disorganised show. And then when they brought somebody else in from WWF to be a writer, Vince Russo, he made it ten times worse. During this period, WCW was in a fierce rating battle with WWF, known as the Monday Night Wars. Russo's strategy to win this war often involved using title changes as a shock tactic, but often failed to create meaningful or memorable championship reigns. One of the significant criticisms of Russo's frequent title changes was that it devalued the championship belts themselves. When titles change hands too often, it can diminish their prestige and importance, making them seem less coveted, prizes are more like props in a story. The frequent belt changes often disrupted any consistent or, coher or, co or coherent storytelling, making it, different, making it difficult for audiences to become invested in any one wrestler. This approach, can led, this approach led to viewer fatigue and a loss of interest in the WCW product. Constant title changes can undermine the credibility of wrestlers also. When champions are not given adequate time to establish themselves in their new role, it can hinder their ability to connect with the audience and build a legacy. Traditional wrestling fans who valued long-term storytelling and the prestige of championships often reacted negatively to Russo's style. This approach alienated both a portion of WCW's core fan base, contributing to the company's struggles. 
by the end of the NWO's run in WCW, they had seen 41 members wear their t-shirts and announce that they were NWO for life. That's an entire wrestling company's roster, all aligned to a single faction, albeit one that was split into several different versions. Here is a brief list of every single member. Well, I say brief, it's 41 people. Scott Hall, Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, Randy Savage, The Giant, Lex Luger, Shawn Michaels, The Great Muta, Kurt Henning, Booker T and Dusty Rhodes, Eric Bischoff, Scott Steiner, Bret Hart, Rick Rude, Sting, Jeff Jarrett, Buff Bagwell and Tori Wilson, Scott Norton, The Disciple, Louis Spicoli, Ted DiBiase, Fake Sting, Vincent, Michael Wall Street, Dennis Rodman, Kyle Petty, Ron and Don Harris, Big Bubba Rogers, Stevie Ray, Disco Inferno, Nick Patrick, Masahiro Chono, Miss Elizabeth Six, Conan, Horace Hogan, Brian Adams and fucking David Flair. It can be hard to really wrap your head around. This list contains some of the most iconic and influential performers to ever step between the ropes. Great Muta is one of the defining faces of the 80s and 90s in Japan and revolutionized the idea of horror and mysticism in pro wrestling. My name is Conan in Mexico. I'm known as Conan El Barbaro. I've wrestled for just about every major promotion in the world. I have three decades wrestling, promoting, discovering talent, mentoring talent. Conan went on to found Triple A in Mexico and reinvigorated the Lucha Libre scene with his involvement in Lucha Underground. Dusty Rhodes was instrumental in the early days of NXT in the development of characters within that brand. Booker T led the way for African American performers both in WCW and WWE and now with his own wrestling chain in gym. Shawn Michaels, Mr. WrestleMania, is widely thought to have had some of the greatest matches in pro wrestling history and was an enormous part of the WWE's success during the Attitude Era and beyond. Jeff Jarrett started the promotion TNA and, although it went through some rough patches, has been revived like a phoenix in the modern era. I don't want to say it can't happen because anything can happen in the wrestling business, but it would take a special dynamic. There were only five of us, and we never washed it down. NWO ruined themselves by letting everyone join. I think there were something like 350 members, right? There were five members of DX, and we all clicked, and we all knew our positioning. We worked together to make something special, and we knew how to feed off each other to make it work. However, there is a downside to the NWO collating this huge roster of stars. The original idea of three members meant that each member had their role and knew how to play it at times perfectly. Hogan was the front man. He would regularly be in the main event of shows and challenge for the company's top belt. Nash and Hall initially played two roles. They were Hogan's right and left hand. They supported his effort to be the top champion in WCW, whilst at the same time, remaining both regularly challenging for the tag titles and often featured alongside Hogan in the pay-per-view main events. All three men, charismatic and entertaining in their own ways, with clear differences, allowing new audiences to clearly define their roles. With almost 50 members, this feeling was destroyed. Be honest, how many of the members which I named in the previous list do you know for certain were in the NWO at some point? Okay, that's easy enough, but could you remember when they joined and to which factions they're a part of? So many forgettable members of the NWO throughout its history is one defining factor in the downfall of the group, and in part the company which it had been so instrumental in making popular. I don't play well with others. I never really wanted that. I remember coming back in 98. One of the suggestions was for me in the NWO, and I was like, absolutely not. There's 15 guys in the NWO. They don't need me and I don't need them. With interest in the NWO at its lowest point by the middle of 1999, the groups had fizzled out, with Hogan returning to his original heroics and good guy persona, but WCW head office knew that without the full force of their most popular team, they would continue to struggle against their rivals in WWE in the ongoing Monday Night War. In an attempt to revitalize interest in the group, the NWO 2000 were created with the heavy emphasis on new in New World Order. On the formation of the NWO 2000 faction, when Bret Hart said the band is back together, little could we have known just how badly this concept would fail. It was meant to be a reinvigoration of the group with the hot addition of Bret Hart, who was raring to be at the centre of something more important in WCW, 
Since his widely anticipated arrival in the company, it looked like everything was laid out perfectly. Then, Brett was severely injured during a match against Goldberg at Starcade. He suffered a head injury and was forced to rehabilitate before it eventually caused him to retire. This left his newly formed NWO without their main selling point and took away the importance of the faction. People wanted to see Bret Hart in WCW. Him being aligned with the New World Order brought Bret Hart fans to the brand, and now all of that was lost. The conspiracy theory that Vince McMahon sent Vince Russo to WCW to sabotage it from within is interesting and fun to read about, but is a notable piece of wrestling lore that lacks any credible evidence and is largely considered a baseless rumour within the professional wrestling community. Vince Russo was a significant creative force in the WWF during the Attitude Era, a period known for its edgy and groundbreaking content. He left WWE for WCW in 99, a time when the company was struggling against its rivals in the ratings war. The timing of Russo's move to WCW combined with the subsequent decline of the company and the radical changes he implemented there fueled speculation amongst fans. Russo's booking style in WCW, characterised by controversy and often criticised creative decisions, led to further decline in WCW's fortunes. But there's no concrete evidence to support the claim that McMahon sent Russo to WCW just to destroy it. The theory is largely based on speculation and coincidences rather than factual proof. Russo's move to WCW can be more realistically attributed to professional reasons such as career advancement, creative freedom or financial incentives, common factors in many career changes. Russo has publicly denied the conspiracy theory on multiple occasions. He has explained his move as a career decision driven by his desire for greater creative control than he currently had in the WWF. Vince McMahon has not publicly addressed this conspiracy theory in any substantial way, which is not unusual given his general approach to not giving credence to baseless rumours. Other industry figures and wrestling historians have generally dismissed the theory as a fanciful rumour. While Russo's tenure in WCW is widely regarded as controversial and having a negative impact, it is typically attributed to his creative style and the chaotic environment in WCW at the time, rather than any deliberate sabotage. In the world of pro wrestling, where storylines often blur the lines between reality and fiction, fans are prone to developing and believing in conspiracy theories. The idea of a covert operation to undermine a rival company makes for a compelling story and fits the larger-than-life narrative style of professional wrestling as a whole. The theory provides a simplistic explanation for the complex problems that led to WCW's decline, which involved numerous factors including mismanagement, financial issues and many internal conflicts. When you look at those first three months, bro, the ratings are up. The ratings were working, our plan was going according to exactly what Ed and I discussed. We got to erase everything they're doing, we've got to build new people, we've got to build new stars. It was working perfectly. Then of course, bro, politics played its ugly head. I went home, you know, they brought in different people. In the three months that we had built, after three months, bro, they had brought it right back down to where it was before we got there. Thus, they called me back. Vince, we need you to get back here. Honest to God, at that point when I went back, I knew we lost the audience. I knew there was no way we are going to get the audience back. We had them. We were building for three months. Then they went backwards three months to the same crap they were doing. It's done. It's over. Obviously, I had to go back because I was contractually obligated. But I knew at that point, bro, we were not going to get these people back again. Vince Russo has claimed in interviews that when he began his tenure in WCW, the ratings were at 2.6 for Monday Nitro, and within three months, they had increased to 3.5. Examining Nielsen Ratings, a verified television rating system, we find that Nitro did indeed average a 2.6 on October the 11th, 99, just before Russo's takeover. By January the 10th, the episode preceding his temporary departure, the rating was at 3.4, which is quite close to his claim. However, the context is essential. It's true that the ratings on January the 10th were higher, but this episode was one of the first two-hour nitros after a period of long three-hour shows since 1997. Shorter broadcasts can theoretically achieve higher average ratings more easily than longer ones. 
Additionally, the ratings during this period from January the 17th to April the 3rd, when Russo wasn't involved, varied wildly, ranging from 3.6 in February to 1.8 in April. This indicates that Nitro's ratings were highly volatile regardless of Russo's involvement. To put this in perspective, consider that on February the 8th, Nitro hit a rating of 5.7 for a 3 hour show, and on December the 11th, the rating was just 1.7 for a 2 hour show. This fluctuation suggests that while there is some evidence of Vince Russo positively impacting the show's ratings, especially during his initial run, this data should be interpreted cautiously. I don't make excuses, I knew what I was getting into bro, but I didn't think I knew the degree. I don't think I really knew how serious it was. While Russo's tenure coincided with a ratings increase, attributing this solely to his influence is an oversimplification. The ratings of WCW Monday Nitro were subject to a variety of factors and exhibited significant fluctuations during this period. Vince Russo's time at WCW is remembered for a series of contentious events and tactics, often criticised as attempts to create shock value and boost ratings, but these decisions sometimes created rifts with established WCW stars, leading to internal strife and a sense of discontent among the wrestlers. In evaluating Vince Russo's influence on WCW, the overall assessment tends to be negative. This perception is largely due to his penchant for sensational storytelling, frequent and rapid changes in championship belts, complex and often confusing storylines, and a heavy reliance on non-wrestler figures in prominent roles. These elements collectively contributed to a decline in WCW's quality and appeal at the time, which played a role in the company's eventual decline. However, it's crucial to recognise that the downfall of WCW was the result of many factors, and Russo's stint was just one aspect of a broader set of challenges that the company faced. There wasn't much I enjoyed about WCW. The downfall was strictly business. AOL, AOL didn't want to be in the wrestling business. The final night of WCW Nitro, which took place on March the 26th, 2001, was a pivotal moment in the history of professional wrestling. It was a night filled with emotion, sadness, and had a profound impact on the wider wrestling landscape. The emotional atmosphere of that night was palpable. Many wrestlers, behind the scenes staff, and fans had been a part of WCW for years, and there was a deep sense of nostalgia and longing as WCW eventually came to an end. Wrestlers who had spent a significant part of their careers in WCW, such as Booker T, Diamond Dallas Page and Sting were visibly emotional during their final appearances on the show. The uncertainty of the future weighed heavily on the minds of those involved, as WWE had purchased WCW, and there was a sense of what this meant for their careers. Flair lost the final match of Nitro to Sting, recreating the second match of Nitro in 1995. Nevertheless, Flair has repeatedly stated in various interviews how happy he was when WCW finally closed down, although at the same time, the fact that many people would lose their jobs had saddened him. As we watched Flair's emotional final match against Sting, an echo of so many classic battles, it was not just the end of an era for World Championship Wrestling, but the closing of a significant chapter in the story of a man who lived and breathed wrestling. Ric Flair's influence continues to resonate today, inspiring new generations of wrestlers who look to the Nature Boy as the gold standard of what it means to be a legend in the squared circle. Following their success during the Attitude Era and victory in the fabled Monday Night War, this wrestling behemoth was still exploding in popularity. Mere days after it was announced that Vince had purchased WCW, a simulcast took place where both companies' show would air simultaneously under the ownership of WWE. However, on the night, just as Vince was celebrating his business strategy, his son Shane came across the airwaves from the WCW portion of the show. As the program went off air, Shane explained that when Vince was about to purchase the company, Shane managed to somehow sneak in and alter the WCW contract. Where the new owner's name was found on the paperwork, it did say McMahon, but to the shock of audiences around the world, it said Shane McMahon. This led to the beginning of the invasion of Vince McMahon's company at the hands of their long-term Monday Night War rivals. The end of WCW Nitro marked the end of the Monday Night Wars, a fierce rivalry between WWE and WCW. With WCW's closure, WWE became the one dominant force in the wrestling industry. 
the closure of WCW Nitro marked the end of an era in professional wrestling. WCW had been a major competitor to WWE for years, and its demise consolidated WWE's position as the premier wrestling promotion around the world. The final night of WCW Nitro was a somber and emotional moment. It marked the end of a major wrestling promotion and had a profound impact on the industry as a whole. The nostalgia and sadness felt by those involved and the wrestling community as a whole served as a poignant reminder of the ever-changing nature of the wrestling landscape. Over the next few years, we saw the likes of Mick Foley, William Regal and even Stephanie McMahon take up the role of opposing manager to Vince McMahon. The competitiveness of wrestling died with the end of Nitro. The Monday Night Wars pushed WWE to do its best. The fans were winning too. In fact, they were winning the most. The New York Times reported, Smackdown, Ted Turner's wrestling career is over. In what may be the ultimate plot twist in wrestling's ever vicious soap opera, World Wrestling Federation Entertainment Inc. said yesterday, that it would buy its most reviled rival and Mr. Turner's pet project, World Championship Wrestling, a unit of AOL Time Warner. The deal may put wrestling characters like The Rock and Hulk Hogan in the same ring. It also means that many of the wrestlers who defected from the World Wrestling Federation to its rivals to escape the wrath of the Federation's outspoken chairman, Vincent K. McMahon, will again become part of his circus-like empire. While the Federation refused to say how much it paid for its competitors, an executive close to the transaction says it was in the low eight figures. Analysts estimate that the WCW, which has recently been plagued by deteriorating ratings, lost as much as $80 million last year. The question now became, who is WWE going to hire? The older guys were a little nervous. Some of their contracts had these crazy stipulations for insane amounts of money. It would have been impossible to bring them in. Um, I, I think it's important to be taken seriously um, as an entertainment company. Uh, and, and we are that. Uh, and we have wound up to be the, the only entertainment company of its kind uh, still in existence and flourishing. The invasion, however, did not begin immediately after WrestleMania X7. The WWF needed time to prepare for their biggest show of the year, and the storyline would have to wait. Contract negotiations were taking longer than expected, and initial fan reactions seemingly didn't go the way in which the McMahons had wanted. WWF had been a rival organization to the WCW for quite some time. With the new infusion of stars and the cross-branded storylines, this does nothing but raise the potential for us. We're very pleased to have come to an agreement to purchase that brand. The initial plan was to continue running WCW as a separate entity with its own time slot on TNN, later renamed Spike TV, and now known as the Paramount Network. To determine the name of the new show, polls were even put up on both WWF.com and WCW.com. Unfortunately, this plan fell through due to the fact that no television station was willing to touch WCW because of its reputation for losing money. Instead of giving up on the idea of incorporating WCW into its programming, the WWF had carried out a brand extension in 1999. This resulted in the running of two televised shows, Raw and SmackDown, and the need for more stars to bolster the ranks. So when it finally came time for the first of the World Championship roster to appear on their rival show, who would the decision makers behind the scenes pick? We'd seen Hogan, Hall and Nash revolutionise the idea of a hostile takeover when they left WWF to join the WCW as the New World Order. That debut is one of the most iconic and memorable moments in all of pro wrestling history. So, as the invasion was about to begin, this time in reverse, surely Vince McMahon realised how much of a crucial, landmark moment that first WCW wrestler to appear on WWF programming would be. Perhaps a fan favourite like Sting, Ric Flair or Goldberg could arrive, instantly recognisable to even the most casual of wrestling fans from the day, bringing with them star power and a winner's prestige, and put the whole locker room on notice. 
Maybe you could introduce some hot up-and-comers to show the WWF fans that the company was looking towards the future and to inject some vigour into the roster. The likes of Rey Mysterio were on the roster at this point. Or maybe just go with the ultimate reverse NWO moment where Hogan, Hall and Nash return as conquering champions of the WCW brand. But no, instead we got Lance Storm. Lance Storm, who performed a run-in during a match on May 28th episode of Raw as War. A talented and seemingly nice enough wrestler, but when compared to the named list, was this fairly bland and lesser known mid-carder the best person for such an important role? Okay, so the first WCW appearance was perhaps a misstep, but then WWF fully tripped and seemed to fall flat on its face. By 2000, Everybody was talking about the company going under or being sold. People were reading the dirt sheets. Rumours were everywhere. Hugh Morris made his WWF debut on the June the 4th episode of Raw is War by Attacking Edge. Completely unannounced and to the cheers and boos of the crowd in attendance, Morris climbed the top rope with his foe on the mat and performed a beautiful moonsault. The technical prowess of the move was seemingly all this debut had to offer though. Hugh Morris, a man with a pun name and almost nothing else memorable about his character. Excellent, what a start. Mike Awesome was not a man of fierce loyalty to any one particular wrestling promotion. He had recently abandoned his role as ECW World Champion and left to join what he saw as a greener pastures in WCW. Awesome is related to Hulk Hogan and felt he would receive favourable treatment in the new company because of it. However, shortly after his arrival in World Championship Wrestling, the company was bought by the WWF, and now, here we are. Mike Awesome, a huge lump of a man who had made a name for himself against wrestling purists, with his hard-hitting powerbombs and ridiculously sickening chair shots. He was now running down a backstage walkway under an arena and flattening the WWF hardcore champion Rhino, blindsiding him and snatching the WWF belt away from his fallen enemy. Mike Awesome posed proudly with his new championship in a company which he wasn't officially signed to. Oh, the joy of the invasion and the 24-7 hardcore championship rule at this time. We knew something was coming, but I always thought that we were going to get a reprieve, a lifeline. At King of the Ring on June the 24th, then WCW wrestler Booker T interfered during the triple threat main event match for the WWF Championship, nearly costing Stone Cold Steve Austin the title, a confrontation which finally felt fitting for such a big occasion. The next night on Raw, which was held in New York City's Madison Square Garden, Booker T had spoken as the WCW champion on the last ever episode of Monday Night Nitro, in a moment which saw him lacking confidence and his now well-recognised charisma. However, as he appeared from behind the unaware Vince McMahon, things were different. The crowd exploded as the owner of the WWF was sent crashing to the mat by a scissor kick and then pummeled by Booker T's quick beatdown before the final flourish from the WCW champion and a trademark spinner Rooney. This incident marked the official start of the Invasion storyline, with Raw is War commentator Jim Ross announcing the battle lines have been drawn. On June the 28th, 2001, WCW Tag Team Champions Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare made their WWF debuts by invading SmackDown by attacking the Hardy Boys and the Dudley Boys. During a tag team match before fleeing after WWF wrestlers came out after them to the ring. Despite the initial animosity towards the WCW product and talent, WWF attempted to integrate them by giving WCW the final 20 minutes of the July 2nd episode of Raw, with Scott Hudson and Arn Anderson as the announcers in place of Jim Ross and Paul Heyman. During a match between Buff Bagwell and Booker T for the WCW Championship, WWF wrestlers Kurt Angle and then WWF champion Stone Cold Steve Austin interfered in retaliation by beating Booker T up, with Bagwell joining Angle and Austin 
by attacking Booker T. Unfortunately, this match was not well received by the audience in attendance at the Tacoma Dome in Tacoma, Washington, with some online calling it the worst match ever. Due to the negative reaction from the core WWF viewership towards the WCW product and talent, coupled with the fact that a World Championship Wrestling program tailored to appeal to a WWF fan base would not come to fruition, the entire WCW contingent was abruptly turned heel. This was a departure from the original plan of having WCW talent strictly attack heel WWF wrestlers. We bought WCW because it would be a great way to propel our core business, the sports entertainment genre, to a new height. I thought I'd retire in WCW. I never imagined that I would end up with me going into WWE as the WCW champion. It was a situation where you hoped that some of these guys that we did bring in, somebody might break through. Somebody might break out. What would our lives be like without competition? Now we have no choice. We are going to lose our bargaining power. It was unique to be a performer at that time, and as a fan, it was insane. Overnight, the roster had almost doubled in size. Alongside the current WWF performers, Vince McMahon and his team of writers also had to factor in the wrestlers in their current programming. Following the disbanding of the alliance, the WWF found itself in a predicament concerning the numerous championships they had accumulated from acquiring all of their rivals' belts. As a result, each individual title value diminished. To address this issue, the WWF initiated a process of unifying several championships. Several titles were unified on this night as well. Edge defeated Test to combine the WCW United States Championship and the WWF Intercontinental Belt while the Dudley Boys triumphed over the Hardys in a steel cage match to merge the WCW and WWF tag team belts. Additionally, the final ECW member, Jazz, made her debut during a six-pack challenge for the vacant WWF Women's Championship, which was ultimately won by Trish Stratus. Her Survivor Series, Alliance members Tess won a battle royal featuring both Alliance and WWF wrestlers, earning him immunity from termination for a year. Over the following weeks, Test exploited this immunity, attacking and bullying other wrestlers for no reason and often assaulting referees. Whenever he was confronted, he would remind everyone of his immunity from being fired. However, this angle was eventually abandoned and mostly forgotten. The immunity was also extended to any Alliance member who held a championship at the conclusion of Survivor Series. Stone Cold Steve Austin, who was the WWF champion, the Dudley Boys, Rob Van Dam, Billy Kidman, and Christian all received this immunity. Of these wrestlers, everyone except RVD, who was already cheered by fans despite being in the alliance, remained a heel. Stacey Keebler, the manager of the Dudleys, and Taz, a SmackDown commentator who had been kicked out of the alliance weeks prior, also received immunity. On the Raw following Survivor Series, Vince McMahon then revealed that he had assumed complete ownership of the company. The, the alliance had just been such an unmitigated disaster for all of us involved, you know. Yes, I mean, why not? I mean, you know, as a flexible human being and a flexible businessman, you have to go with, you know, what conditions are. Conditions change sometimes beyond anything you have to do with them, and, and you either rock with them or, or you die. In 2003, following the invasion of the NWO and the return of Hulk Hogan, Vince McMahon began to interfere in matches to ensure that the invaders from WCW would not dominate his roster. During the iconic match between Hogan and The Rock, McMahon came to ringside and distracted Hogan, allowing for The Rock to attack him from behind with a chair before gaining the victory. This led to bad blood between Hogan and McMahon, and their storyline carried on through much of the year. When it came time for the pair to finally oppose one another in the ring, WrestleMania proved to be the most fitting of stages. After all, if you go back to the very beginning, WrestleMania won almost two decades prior, an event set up in Hogan's name and used as a tool to promote the company's top star, created and funded by Vince McMahon. The pair's careers diverging and combining over the course of almost 20 years to finally come toe-to-toe -to -toe on the stage which they were both instrumental in the founding of. Magical moments like these are few and far between. 
So regardless of my personal feelings on the two men and the quality of their match, it is hard to argue with the magnitude of this encounter. Despite the intense action and rivalries during the invasion, the WWF ultimately emerged as the dominant force, successfully thwarting the Alliance's attempt to seize control of the wrestling world. During the storyline, there was a pattern of WWF wrestlers consistently defeating their ECW and WCW counterparts in interpromotional matches, often securing clean victories. Conversely, most of the Alliance's wins were tainted by controversy, involving interference and disqualifications. This discrepancy in outcomes led to critics pointing out the overemphasis on Steve Austin as he seemed to be the sole credible superstar within the Alliance, and, after all, he was actually a WWF wrestler. Matt Hardy expressed the sentiments of WWE talent regarding the invasion, stating, Man, everybody in WWE hated it. I mean, we know it wasn't good for the industry. We knew it wasn't good for the talent. He further noted that the acquisition of WCW and the subsequent demise of ECW diminished their leverage in negotiation for better deals and compensation. A prominent example of this disparity was evident during the inaugural brawl at the Invasion pay-per-view. While Steve Austin's pivotal role in the match secured a WCW and ECW victory over the WWF, Slam Wrestling noted that the performance of the Alliance fell short compared to the WWF wrestlers. They highlighted how the Alliance was depicted as disorganised and inferior, often executing mistimed moves that inadvertently harmed their own teammates. In contrast, the WWF squad was portrayed as a cohesive and well-coordinated unit. The portrayal of the ECW and WCW wrestlers as weak and reliant on double-teaming and underhanded tactics sent a clear message that they were not on the same level as their counterparts. Speculation arose regarding their motivation behind this imbalance, suggesting that Vince McMahon sought to avoid portraying the WWF as weak in its battle against the Alliance. McMahon had fiercely competed with WCW in the Monday Night Wars, and it's likely that he was unwilling to present the rival brand as equally formidable. As Smash Wrestling pointed out, this could explain why WWF wrestlers needed to defect to the Alliance, as it created the illusion of a credible threat to the WWF's dominance. From 2001, when Vince soon realised that in order to better manage the enormous roster he was now the sole owner of, he would need to split the company into two separate and competing brands, with WWE SmackDown and Raw to air as rival programmes with rival rosters. The brand split meant that, in opposition to the dastardly McMahon character, the other show would be run by another on-screen manager. The utilisation of WCW talent was a significant issue with the invasion angle. While WWE did bring in talented wrestlers from WCW such as Booker T, Diamond Dallas Page and before that Chris Jericho, they were not given the opportunity to shine to their full potential. This lack of credibility and excitement could have been addressed by providing these wrestlers with prominent storylines that positioned them as legitimate threats to WWE's top stars. One approach to improving the angle would have been to emphasise the experience and accomplishments of the WCW wrestlers. Given that the company had been a prominent promotion for over a decade, many of their wrestlers had achieved championships and competed in high-profile matches. Recognising and highlighting these achievements would have added credibility to the WCW wrestlers, making fans more invested in their characters and viewing them as formidable competitors. Whilst it can be fun to go back and look at some of the low points of World Championship Wrestling in its final days, perhaps Hulk Hogan and his cronies act had worn completely thin and you were desperate for something new. Or maybe it was Vince Russo's wild storylines and nonsensical characters which truly turned you away in the late 90s. But behind that, you have hundreds of creative people working hard each week to bring us, wrestling fans, a show to be entertained and amazed by. From those operating the sound equipment, lighting rigs and cameras, costume designers, theme music creators, referees, announcers and commentators, it not only ended a significant era in professional wrestling, but also profoundly influenced the industry's future. 
While WCW's demise led to the temporary monopoly of WWE, it also set the stage for the emergence of new wrestling promotions and a re-evaluation of wrestling entertainment. WCW's legacy, both positive and negative, remains a pivotal chapter in the annals of wrestling history. The company will always hold a special place in my heart, a wrestling brand that got me hooked into this weird world of sequins and suplexes all those years ago, and one that, without, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you now. So for that, I'm eternally grateful. Thanks for watching.